Ladies' Night Owls on Greatest Hits Radio. You never know who's going to call next. 0191 488 3188. Greatest Hits Radio. Now, do you know what we mentioned? The button fear. I found a copy of it. I'll be able to share that with you a bit later on. And also, whenever we talk about anything on Night Owls, we always get someone who kind of swims against the tide. Mo Farah, yeah, genuinely beloved by many uh, a Night Owl. We know this. And, yeah, just had a, a call. I didn't want to come on air. Just saying that won't even speak to them. You know, he seems really arrogant and doesn't like uh, the man at all. Where do you stand? Have you tried to talk to him? Is he really pally? Who knows? Oh one nine one four double eight three one double eight. Ooh, everybody's got a dark side. Let's crack on. We are we're kicking off with something that I think you guys might be able to help us with. We've got Dave in South Shields. Hi, Dave. Hello, Alan. Hello, man. Now, traditionally, you come on and ask me to identify some music. I gather you've got some more for me. No, I, I think you must be thinking of another day of some South Shields, actually. Well, I beg your pardon. It's just you've got a couple of musical questions. What's the crack? Well, they're not questions. It's just a couple of points I'd like to make. OK. Um, the first one is, um, it's, it's a, a sort of long-standing irritation of mine. Uh-huh. Um, I'm, I'm of the same generation as you. Right. Um, I went to school uh, and I've got to a point where you would take LPs, those, those <laughs> things that were called LPs in those days. Absolutely. You'd take them in, into school with you. Yeah. And it was basically to show off to your mates. Yes. And um, it was a case of, it was almost like a, an obscurity contest. You know, the, the more outlandish or obscure the band that you had the LP by, the more kudos you got. Absolutely right. And um, <laughs> so you ended, you ended up with albums by... Bands like Warhorse and, uh, <laughs> you know, Egg and things like that. Black, Black Cat Bones, oh, albums like that. wow, yeah. But the thing, the point I'm trying to make is that, I mean, for all that, they, they were bands. Yes. And this week, of course, they've had X Factor, the band. Ah, oh, right. And in my book, a band is something which implies musical instruments. It's not a, a group of dancers who sing or a group of singers who dance. Yeah, and also have the benefit of that auto-tuning, so even when they're singing exactly. rubbish, I mean, they've got to be able to get up on stage without all of that and yeah, do it, play exactly. it. No, I get that, absolutely. When I heard, well, you know, it's kind of like the Cowlevision. Cowlevision, Cowl one program ends... The next yeah, one begins, exactly. and it churns out the same stuff over and over and over again. <laughs> I said it; at, I'd really said at the time that they had their first Christmas number one. I thought, leave it, don't do it again. It was a nice; it was interesting to see what you can achieve. They created a number one from nothing, essentially. So yeah. they, there you go. But when they started to take control. And everybody that's working real hard in proper bands coming up to Christmas, they know, well, we're wasting our time because we know what it's going to be. It's going to be a cowl band or a cowl artist, and we're stymied. And I think it, it it's, it's kind of half-killed modern music because if you look at what's in the charts now, how many of them in 10 years' time are we going to be playing on Greatest Hits? I'm guessing probably none. I can't well, think of a one that's like must play. Do you know what I mean? It's it's just yeah, I'm I'm the same, Alan. I mean, I, I'm I'm a dinosaur. I think <laughs> after 1977, the the, the it was a, a sort of decreasing sort of uh. ratio of stuff that I like. No, you're so, quite right. Mine was the and also what you had to do is if you were if you were cred, whatever that meant, because I'm still really not sure. But you had to be with your war horse and your egg and your gong <laughs> and your Jethro Tull and all of that. Yep. I had Jethro Tull and I'd, I'd screen printed a picture of the bloke with his flute on the back of me haversack. I thought I yeah. was the bee's knees. Yeah, Everybody the would come... Most... The, well, the haversack was it because if you carried a, a little briefcase in the West End, you were in big trouble. You had to, yeah, have, exactly. had to have a haver or a sports bag that you'd probably yeah. get, a, probably get away with. You mentioned them just for a tool. I remember seeing them at um, the Sunderland Empire in about 75 oh, or something like that. Oh, my goodness, wow. And I, I'm not kidding. It was the loudest gig I'd ever been to <laughs> because 
that, that played the Empire Pool or something the night before and had the same gear. <sighs> Right. So you, you heard every note eight times, yeah. you know. <laughs> Absolutely. It was just fabulous. But that, that, that's the point I made about the bands. But you mentioned about the X Factor taking over Christmas. Mm. And that leads us on to the second point I wanted to make to you. Um, I'd, I'd heard you over the recent week saying about the Christmas stuff. And yeah. I love the Christmas songs, don't get us wrong, but there's only so much band aid, wham, and played <laughs> that you can take, you know? <laughs> Well, I agree with that. But the weird thing is, well, you know how radio works. You, you yeah, essentially yeah. you get a you get a bunch of people in a room, and they've they've researched every yeah. human being on earth. Although I've never met anybody who's actually been researched, but they've got them all in the room. They've told them the only three songs we like by them is yeah, exactly. such as well to me. And I've fought this all my life. I remember when I very first started at the radio station, and it was. It was vinyl, like, you know, your LP. It was all LPs. And yeah. we would get, yeah, like a box of records, and that was for your show. And then you'd return them to the guy, that, you know, when you'd finished the show and he'd file them all away again. But he'd give you your box of records, and you would have something like, just for sake of argument, the Drifter's Greatest Hits. Yeah. Now, whether you like them or whether it's your bag or whether it's not, I guarantee you'll sing every word because they're that kind of band... And in the back seat to the movies on the yeah, you, you're going to sing it, whatever it is. However, it, there you go. But everyone's, a, everyone's a diamond. However, even back then, they would say, well, we've surveyed all the greatest hits, and the only two that people like are... And I'm thinking, what do you mean the only two that people like? There's, there's 20 songs that's been in the top 10 there. Yeah. So how, how can you tell me that people... Don't like that, but like that. What they should have done is just play the next one on the list, tick it off, and then when you're coming around again, play the next one on the list. Then yeah. you're playing all of them because they're all top ten songs. And I've never of understood course. this cherry-picky... And I, I'm absolutely with you. Because at Christmas, I mentioned the other week that I, Stevie Nicks singing Silent Night's one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, well, can I just... Uh, one of, uh, for that subject... Um, I'd just like to recommend the three albums which I think are like the alternative sort of Christmas stuff. Yeah. Which to me is, is the bee's knees. Uh -huh. And you never hear of them. Do one, tell. One, is, one is an album, I think from about 1987. Mm -hmm. It was called A Very Special Christmas. Oh, I know and these was, albums. I know them. I've seen them. And they're, they're all different artists. Yes, and it had um, the, fight, the closing track was Stevie Nicks. <laughs> Singing that, Sing, singing Silent Night, but it also had on um, Bruce Springsteen oh. singing um, Merry Christmas, Baby. Yes. Uh, Brian Adams singing Run Run Rudolph. Oh, look at that. And um, Bon Jovi doing a one called Backdoor Santa, which was pretty good as well, you know. And they made about three of them. They did. I, I think it was like three years running. They put them. I think they did. They made about three of them, and I'm sure I've got them tucked away somewhere. I'm going to have to go and have. Yeah. Have a sports because you're quite right. The, the and Hootie and the Blowfish are on one of them singing a Christmas song, and people don't listen particularly to Hootie and the Blowfish. But what a band no, they no. what a band they used to be too. Uh -huh. You could go on with this this all night, but I'm absolutely in agreement. To me, the world of the greatest hit, if it's been a greatest hit anywhere, we should be listening to it. Yeah, whatever it is. Now the excuse, I suppose, is that all of those songs on a special Christmas. Haven't been hits, so oh, you can. Exactly. Oh, okay. But they are a Christmas hit, and yeah. I mean anybody that hears those kind of things banging around, you're yeah. going to be first of all you're going to say, how come that's not a regular Christmas thing that yeah, we hear exactly. every every year? And we absolutely another two that people might like to dig out, Alan. Yeah. Um, and I think it's about just after two thousand. Moody Blues put out one called December, and that's got some really good stuff on it as well. There's also a steel eye span, and I know I'm kind of I seem to be heading off into the folk side of yeah. things with Jethro Tull and stuff, but no, uh, no, yes, they did a one I think they called did a Jethro Tull did a Christmas album as well, didn't they? Of course. they? Well, they did a Christmas song. I don't know whether they did a Christmas no, they album. Did a Christmas album. Did they? Oh yeah. my goodness! Got to, all those all those goodies on it. Gonna have to dig them out. But Steel Eye Span did a one that had a song called Winter, and it yeah. just it was just one of those tunes that yeah, you kind of you know when you hear that. Bit of classical music in Greg Lake, so yeah, yeah. it's it just when you hear that, 
your head goes <laughs> Christmas. It does though, yeah. and it's those it. those kind of tunes. Brilliant. Hey, dear, thank you so much. Uh, Stay on I the just, line. Can I, can I just finish, Alan, with one more? Of course. The, to, to me, it's the the, the real these 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 are Christmas albums. What's that? It's Twisted Christmas by Twisted Sister. Twisted Christmas by right. Yeah, you, you have to hear it. <laughs> Hearing them absolutely annihilate or come all you say for the joy that you hold. It's just out of this world. You really got to hear that. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, do me a favour. Stay on the line. I'm going to send you a little double CD by one of the few people in 2019 going 2020 that I think is actually any good. So stay on the line. Little Christmas oh, present we'll send you. All the best. Thanks very much, Alan. You're welcome, man. Hang on in there. Fascinating. And it's what I've always believed. Where do you stand on this whole music thing? What do you want to hear? Because we'd love to, we'd love to deliver it. Simple as. Oh one nine one four double eight three one double eight. Don't forget, you can get yourself a night owl mug tonight, and along with that, all of that stuff from Jumanji, the sleeping bag, the rucksack, and the cap from the brand new movie. Looking forward to it. Uh, if it's as funny as the last one, uh, I'll be well in and well up for that. Incidentally, we're going to be playing a song by the Cause soon, and I've dug out a session that they did for me when they actually came in for my birthday one year to play a few tunes. And it's again, is it Christmassy, the piece of music? Not really, but it's dead cosy. Do you know what I mean? It's dead cosy. 01914 double Pick your telephones up. Looking forward to hearing from you. Paul from Wall's End is with us now. Hi, Paul. Hi, Alan. You all right? I'm yeah. good, my friend. Thank you for coming on. What you got for me? Right, bit of a strange one. I've been wanting to ring you for years to tell you about this one. <laughs> right. And, uh, I've put, put it off and all that. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going back to 1995. And uh, there was me and the girlfriend. Mm. We used to go for, like, drives. You know, it was a bit of a boy racer. Right. And uh, we used to go for drives, you know, late at night and all that. And uh, this one night, she lived in Bladen, so... Right. We went for a drive on the A69. Oh, yeah, the so, Hexham Way. The Hexham Way, heading towards Hexham. Right. Well, you know, like, the road's quite, it's open, you can see for miles. Yep. And uh, so I'm driving along, absolutely dead, nothing on the road. And then all of a sudden, these taillights appeared in front. Right. And I'm thinking, well, you know, you know, you think, well, there's no slip road there. And, mm -hmm. you know, like, where's our car come from sort of thing? It was, it was a bit strange. Right. So, anyway, we, we, we kept on going, got to um, Hexham, and then just past Hexham, you've got the Aiken turn off. Right, yes, you do. So, turn right for that. Yeah, yeah, so it turns right, and uh, the next thing, out of nowhere, there's these headlights, really bright, behind, you know, come behind us. Right. And me being a boy racer and all that, you know. Think the that. worst. I was thinking, mm, so I'll put my foot down a bit, you know, right. bit, bit, uh, bit uh, thingy. Anyway, these headlights, they're just, the, the car just, you know, when you, you accelerate away and you expect, you know, to put a bit of distance between you and the car behind. Sure. And it, it was strange that the headlights were just on, literally two foot from the back of the car. Oh, blame me. And, and I'm, you know, so. The, the the girlfriend she's starting to get a bit irate and who who's this what 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 they're doing and all the rest of it yeah 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 so anyway we got we got I think I got the wall I think it was a place called wall yes anyway spun the car around and uh, you know have a look and say who who the hell you know who the hell Jason it's was what Bruce Willis would have done exactly <laughs> <laughs> but anyway I'll, I'll never ever, honestly, Alan, I'll never ever forget this. And I still see the ex girlfriend now and she she still talks about this. Mm. It was a it was like a brown a Mercedes C L K right. you know, brown vinyl roof. I remember that. Uh -huh. So anyway, it just pulled in front of us and we seen we looked at the woman. There was a woman driving and I'm telling you now, I'll never forget her face. She was not alive. She was transparent. You could actually see through her. It was it was absolutely horrific. Wow. Yeah, exactly. 
I mean, I might sound like a complete nut job, but, but uh, honestly... But there was um, two of you, see, if you'd have just seen it on your, on your Todd, then you might yeah. say, uh, yeah. crack, uh, but uh, your girlfriend saw it too. Well, she just screamed. I mean, honestly, she just screamed. And I just, was the driver know, looking at you? Or, or yes, because, yeah. Because, uh, you know, people talk about, well, do ghosts interact? Or are we just seeing yeah. a glimpse yeah. into another world? This one wasn't just interacting with you. They were. It was she was playing with you. It was like slow motion. It was bizarre. She was looking ahead, and then she just sort of slowly turned her head to the right to, mm. to us, and just stared straight through us. And I, well, she was the the girlfriend was just absolutely panicked. So what screaming. what did you do then? I would imagine probably by that time you had your foot so far on the floor the pedal was probably touching the road. Yeah, a bit of handbrake turn, I think it was. <laughs> I mean, honestly, and I remember, um, I mean, I, I literally did. I put my foot down, and it was it was a clear night. It was, you know, the moon, mm. it was like a full moon. Right. It was one of them nights where you could literally, you could drive with no headlights on. You could see for miles. Mm. It was like, you know, quite lit. So anyway, I'd put, by this time, put the foot down, and I'm going down a long, straight road, and... Within seconds, and I mean seconds, these headlights were back behind her again. Oh, what? And like, like Alan, there's no way, you know, that I would have seen the car turn mm. round, you know, and all, because I was, I'm just glued in the back window looking behind, because yeah. I just want to put some distance between me and this car. It's a fab- it's a fabulous story, Paul. <laughs> but how did you shake her off then? Because presumably, it's not like you could drive home and she wouldn't know where you were. I mean, she's two foot well, from your back bumper. Well, that's, well, that's the thing, Alan. Well, we're going down this long straight road and I'm talking, there's no turn off. It's, you know, like a Roman road. It's a long it straight is, road. absolutely, yeah. And I'm looking and we've got it, we must have got about a mile down the road and the headlights just disappeared like that. Gone. <laughs> and, and I'm, I'm, you know, we're both staring out the back window of the car like just and there's there's nothing there, absolutely nothing there. You could see for miles up the road, and there's nothing there. It was it was unbelievable. I'm just wondering if anybody else has had had, he, had any experience on you know like around there or what. Well, I've made but a note of this because I'm. It is exactly the kind of thing that that mm-hmm. I can research and see if if mm-hmm. there has been a, an incident with a brown Mercedes CLK. Yeah. Well, that's it. It's always been in the back of my mind. Like, what, yeah. what was you know, that? What who was part, that? Who was it? And it why was, did she you pick know. you as well would be the other thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was what kind of car were you in? Oh, it was an old Astra Mark II. <laughs> right. <okay. laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you can remember them. Yeah, I, it was uh, talk about if a boy racer was going to have one. That's probably oh, the I'm one he'd have. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. Hey, but I will, yeah. I will research that, Paul. I promise you. And if I can yeah. find out, even in time for next week, if I can look into it, That'd next week I'll let you know if I can find anything. If I can't, I'll just say nothing came up. But yeah. uh, if something does, I'll be happy to tell you. And if anybody else in the meantime knows someone else who's seen, because we're talking a road that has a lot of. A lot of crashes, sadly, and a, mm-hmm. the, the mm-hmm. odd fatality over the years. Yeah, yeah. So what's the crack uh, about this? A ghostly mm-hmm. Mercedes on the mm-hmm. A69 between Newcastle and uh, pre- presumably the Hexham, Acham, yeah, well, that little yeah. road that goes up to Chollifat, I think, if you keep going yeah, along. Yeah, you know. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, you know, I'll never, ever forget that night. It was just, it was from start to finish, the whole thing was, it, it, it was. It was. It was just. You know, I've never experienced anything like it. But I you mean, know, you know, just, you say you'll you'll never forget it. Neither yeah. will anybody that was driving on that road on their mm. own while you were telling that story. <laughs> <laughs> so I can imagine them going, "Oh, hang on." Brilliant. I mean, honest, honestly, I must sound like some kind of. Uh, no, 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 no. Hey, you, but, you um, tell tell us your experiences. People can judge but, themselves. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I can even uh, I'll, I'll get the girlfriend to come on and back us up. You know, honestly, right. she she still talks about it now. Amazing. Um, well, give me a give me a week to have a, a look at it, and by next week I'll have something or I'll not. Oh, brilliant. either way, give Thanks it a go. Lovely talking to you, Paul. Thanks for coming on, man. Oh, okay. Thanks.
Thank you. Amazing. How about that? What a story. I promised you some cause. You're going to get that. And then my little Christmas bonus on the back of it. Now, do you think that's the greatest song of all? I'm sure. But we need you to answer it and help us compile the ultimate top 500 of the 70s, 80s, 90s. Cast your vote now. You can send you maybe a smart speaker as a Christmas present. Got a few of them thrown in for good measure just for you voting at greatesthitsradio.co.uk. And join us over Christmas and New Year and we'll count down that top 500 as voted for by you. Now, I mentioned at the top of the show, I wanted to find out the kind of odd things that you're scared of. I think there's a lot of people scared of a particular road now. But this was one of our stranger ones. Buttons. <laughs> you got a phobia of buttons? Yep. How do you do your pants up? Well, I knew you were going to say that. Um, <laughs> I don't mind if a button's on your shirt or your pants or whatever. It, it just doesn't bother us. But if I see a button lying on the floor, it literally makes me feel sick. Have you, literally. <laughs> have you, I'm sorry for sick. laughing because you shouldn't, but have you ever had a bad experience with a button? <laughs> I, um, <laughs> I don't think so, no. <laughs> but I mean, I, I used to work in a pub in uh, in Newcastle, um, and I stupidly told the lads that my pub was <laughs> buttons. Your life wouldn't be worth living. No, uh, it wasn't actually. Um, the amount of stray buttons they'd have uh, lying that, around. I, I, I mean, I, I'm a smoker, and I smoke um, roll up cigarettes. Right, yeah. And I don't mean cigarette tin, and that be a button is. Yeah. You know, and then oh, I was. I'd have to get a pair of uh, tweezers or something like that to pull the button out. I couldn't actually touch it. So although if the button was on your shirt or your coat or whatever, you wouldn't have a problem. No, it doesn't bother us. But it's when it's a stri- when, a, when it's a button that's escaped from something. Yeah, but it's stray. How about <laughs> stray buttons? Dun, dun, dun. Never seen a horror film with that. It's only a matter of time now. How about it? Fantastic. Button phobia. What's the weirdest thing that you're scared of? Now, we're coming up to Christmas. So... It's not... Is it Christmassy? I actually think it is. A little bit of Celtic music around Christmas really fits the bill. So here's a session that I managed to get with the cause. And you've heard their greatest hit. Here's the band letting off a little bit of amazing Christmas steam. Alan Robson's Night Owls. The phone-in that gets you talking. Greatest Hits Radio. You are with the big one. And don't forget, Mark Goodyear tomorrow, 10 at 10. And he's also going to hit you with the greatest hit superstars. And it's Erasure. Still sounding great after all those years. If that's your bag, make sure you don't miss it. Now, going to give you your first clue. This is for the sleeping bag, the rucksack, the cap from Jumanji. And also the Alan Robson Night Owls mug. It's two clues that you've got to put together just for the first one. Well, and the second one. The the first clue, the day before Christmas and the film about the pig who thought he was a sheepdog. Put the two together. The day before Christmas, well, you know that, plus the film about the pig who thought he was a sheepdog. Right, that's your first clue. Going to give you three more clues, possibly four, before the end of the show, then you tell me what links them all together. That's your first clue. Three more to come, so get ready for that. As I head out and go and talk to Elliot, who's in Durham. Hello, Elliot. Hello, Alan. How are you doing? You OK? I'm very well, thank you kindly. What are you calling about tonight? Um, I've spoken to you before. Bas- basically, um, I spoke to you last week. Right. Um, but I never managed to get across what I wanted to because my nerves just took over me. Oh, that's all right then. Um, well, let's have a go tonight then. Yeah, well, I was talking about, you know, the pre- uh, parental alienation? Yes. Um, well, basically, what we are, um, we're a group of parents campaigning for our, our children's rights to have a relationship with both parents and yes. the extended families. Uh-huh. Um, as we know, nothing's more at breaking than a child being denied rights to see both parents, grandparents, uncles, aunties and so forth. Yeah. Up to date, there's four million kids waking up at Christmas morning 
without one of the parents in their lives, and that's without grandparents and stuff. Right. So basically, what we are, we're a company, we're, we're a group called PA, PA Day UK, which is Papa Alpha Day UK, just one word. We're on Facebook. Right. And basically, we're just reaching out to, um, and trying to get a, a, a bit of a Christmas message out to people that, I mean, I'm in Durham, but we're, we're about across the, across the country. And right. we're just setting up for people to come forward mm. um, because this time of year there's a lot of people what go under because of this and we're trying to we're trying to reach out and trying to save um, a lot of people going under or I mean I've heard I've heard many a tale of grandparents going to court to try and you know win the right yeah. to talk to their own grandchildren it, I, it seems it ridiculous is. that anybody would have to go to that kind of length well I know but I mean it's one of them things now, on this one, what we've got, the four million kids waking up without um, one of the parents, if you think about grandparents on one side, uncles, aunties, that's probably 20 million family members potentially yeah. affected over the Christmas. Yeah. And what we also plan on doing, we're just going for a charity status. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a PA day, which is in Piccadilly, Manchester, on the 25th. Right. That's already set up. We've got um, some public speakers coming. Okay. Um, hopefully, we'll get like Neil McAvoy in that. Right. But, um, and what we're setting up doing as well, a lot of the older people are not aware that they can, they can actually apply, apply for contact. Mm. So I'm at me, we're setting up a group up at the northeast to help the, the grandparents to show them how to fill the forms in, right. what information they need, so they can go forward and they can try and reconnect with lost ones. How does it work? It just seems that every family, that all you need is one member of that Mm -hmm. partnership, usually mum or a dad, who mm -hmm. decides, I want nothing to do with that side of the family ever again. And usually it's the one that's got custody of the child that causes the problems. Why Why? Why can't courts do this, fa first of all, faster? Because it just seems as soon as a... Uh, and I, I actually know the answer to this. It's money. If you go to, if you, go to uh, you know, solicitors and barristers... If they deal with it in 10 minutes, they're not making money from you. If they deal with it over two and a half years, they're making, they're getting a, a pool built. Do you know what I mean? So I kind of understand this, but there's got to be a way of streamlining it. So, because the kids are piggy in the middle here, aren't they? Well, th th this is a worldwide phenomenon. Now, there's certain countries like Mexico where it's classed as a criminal, criminal offence, and the mothers or dads who do this get seven years. Um, wow. Other countries now are starting to get onto it. Now, the governments in this country, they don't see that it's it's a problem. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of things linked to it. I mean, you've got, like, um, Gary Crooks and that, who runs a lot of charities and different things. Mm -hmm. He's in, um, he's in Dear Bolt, the kids, the kids' prison. And right, right. I spoke to him the other day, and I, and I said it must be over 80% are from broken families. Mm -hmm. And he didn't give me a figure, but he kind of sniggered, which kind of told me he knows it's higher than that. Right. So all the kids in these broken in these um, homes, care homes and things, are coming through the system. Now, what I try and tell people, because on, on Facebook, some people say, well, why are you campaigning so much? What difference does it make? I say, well, if there's 4 million kids waking up without a parent, 50% mm. of them are going to be bad. Do you want them kids on your street mm. when they've, had, they've not been brought up the right way, they've mm. lost half the identity, they don't know who they are? They're the ones that are going to cause the trouble, you know? But, um, well, I, I mean, that, it, it, that's kind of a generalisation, but we, do, we yeah. just want to give... Uh, my view on that is... Not well, they're bound to be bad because I, I'm just a great believer that kids sometimes can be incredibly resilient when they've got to face that kind of thing. But it's just the bottom line is mm -hmm. it's the right thing to do that, that a child should have access to both parents if they want it. I mean, it's well, it's not rocket science by any stretch. No, what we're campaigning for for the long term goal <clears throat> is to have um, co parenting, you know, if right. parents split up, that's the first thing they have, unless there's there's reasons like there's any forms of abuse which is documented and that rightly so the mother or the dad should not be involved with them kids. Yeah, but we heard just the other week from another night owl who rang in saying that for about 15, 20 years he's been fighting to see his child and as soon as he does, uh, the woman will make another allegation about him. All of them have been disproven, but it doesn't matter. She'll go to another court in another county and start the whole thing off again. When I would have thought, just disprove a lies once, and then share the the custody of the children. It would be my suggestion. But it seems the way that everybody used to say, "Oh, isn't British law it's the finest in the world?" No, it isn't really, not. is it? It's not really. But what I can tell you is, 
in, crim- in criminal law, um, you're innocent until proven guilty. In mm. family law, you're guilty. You have around. to prove yourself innocent. Yeah. Now, if it's an allegation which is fabricated, how can you prove otherwise? And the other thing, family courts <clears throat> operate behind closed doors. So right. there's no independent reviews. We've already asked for an independent review. It's been knocked back. They don't want it. And I'll tell you why they don't want it. Because two, between April 2017 and April 2018, the government made just off application fees for court alone £521 million, sure. And that's without the mediation, the right. solicitors. So it's just a big money spinner, you know. And it's sure. wrong. Yeah. But, um, <clears throat> we're, but for us, basically, we're just trying to fight. Not for our kids, for all the kids. Because we don't want to see kids going through this. I went through it myself as a kid, mm. and I know the damages, what it does to you. Oh, for sure. Um, I mean, I, I know you've not got long, so I'll, I'll say this quick. Um, see, you'll be aware of your chromosomes and stuff, so you've got, mm. obviously, your mum's side, your dad's side. Mm. If if your mum or your dad's removed from you as a young child, that's 50% of your identity less uh, lost. Mm-hmm. If that other parent can put that input into you, when you get to adulthood, you can kind of like a dog chasing its tail. I mean, I'm 44 and I'm just starting now to realise what the purpose is. Mm. Um, and it's just through learning this over the last few years, you know. Mm. But you end up, you're running around in a circle because you, you, you don't know who you are. Yeah, no, and you and know, it's yeah. kind of, it's a, it's, a lost, it's a lost cause. And mm. at the minute, since 2003, 48% rise in, in depression and anxiety in mm. kids alone. But we know, we, can't, we haven't got clear stats of this, but we know because we've got unis working on it, we know that a massive proportion of that is linked to fallen families or, you know, broken families kind of thing. Well, I mean, <clears throat> in fairness, the uh, the thing that I can say is over the years, I've spoken to thousands of mm-hmm. young people saying, mm-hmm. I'm trying to find me mum, I'm trying to find me dad. With My parents split up when I was a kid. My mother never let me talk to her. And uh, I hate her for that. And... <laughs> It's it's a problem for a lot of people, and uh, well, this is another I one. I hear you loud and clear. These these boys or girls, if they if they learn to hate the mother, I can I can tell you one thing: hating your mother is one of the worst things that any child could go through. It destroys you. Mm-hmm. I mean, I dislike my mother, but not just for alienation. I was abused in every way she ever form, and mm-hmm. this is why I fight so much for parental alienation because mm-hmm. this is the worst form of child abuse, and I've been through any form you can think of. By far, this is the worst. Right, hey. Good to you, Elliot. Th- keep in touch and good yeah. luck on the 25th. And thank you for yeah, keeping us on. No if worries. Okay, I'll, I'll pop, back on, pop back on again at some point if that's okay, yeah? Absolutely feel free to. Thanks, Elliot. Thank you very much, Paul. Take care, man. Bye bye. 0191 eight. Ian from Whitburn saying very sad news. Incidentally, this is texting. If you want to text in, feel free to do that. Text Alan, A L E N, plus your message to 61054. 61054. Uh, Alan, very sad news about Mary Fredrickson. I loved Roxette. Classic late 80s and even more early 90s um, with Per Hessel. He was guitarist and songwriter. Sexiest band going at the time. Some great classic hits. The Look. Listen to Your Heart. Feeling Like a Flower. It Must Have Been Love. The Big L. Joyride. Sleeping in My Car. To mention a few of their best. Mary Fredrickson had a great voice. She was beautiful. A greatest hits duo, absolutely. Respect and in our praise, says Ian from Whitburn. Got an interview with them and just, we have literally, it's, it's close to like 100,000 interviews tucked away, ridiculous amount. And we found it and we will uh, be playing a few clips of it between now and the new year. So watch out for that. That's coming at you. Now, Melanie C. We had Melanie B on the show live last week. This week, we've got Melanie C because she's actually seen a ghost. Ever seen a ghost that had a strange, spooky experience of any kind? Um, I, I recall, actually, I was on tour with the girls when my granddad passed away. Yeah. And the, the night after I'd heard the news, I, I had that feeling, you know, when somebody sits on the bed, mm. but there was nobody there, and I kind of always think that was him, just letting right. me know he was still around. Well, that's sweet. Yeah. Okay, um... Best bit and worst bit in the business so far? Highlight and low level. Oh, wow. Well, the highlight has to be up there on stage, that feeling you'll get when you're in front of an audience. It's got to be different from being, being a fifth 
and being you right in the front of them. Yeah, it's really different. And you know, and, and venues are different too. When you're playing arenas, sometimes it becomes so impersonal. So I actually prefer smaller venues where you you know you can really feed off the crowd and get the atmosphere. Look in their eyes. Yeah. The white to their eyes. eyes. So highlight and low light, the best bit and the worst. Okay. Um so best bit performing aspect and worst bit, I, I mean it's gotta be the tabloid media. It's got to be, you know, having to, to put up with, with some of the nonsense that they write. Do you play, Two things here. There's also the trolls that you get on, on social media, which mm -hmm. is it's a bitch at the best of times. Yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with the media and trolls? Do you hit them head on or do you just ignore them? How do, how do you cope with them? Yeah, I, I always try to have a dignified silence. <laughs> I've right. kind of learned that. I think I was a bit more gobby when is I was that younger. after a cry? <laughs> yeah, but you know what? To be honest with you, I mean, everyone's entitled to their opinion, you know? But people are pretty venomous on social media from Absolutely. time to time. So I think it's best to kind of, you know, just take it with a pinch of salt. I try to do uh, what I think is a sensible thing, which is not look. Yeah, that is a good thing to do. Uh, having a good rant, lots of swearing, get it out of your system, and then realise that it doesn't really matter. A lot of people, that's their first social media reply, though. Yeah. And that's never a good thing. Yeah. It, it always shows that I think we may just have scratched a nerve <laughs> yeah. if something like that happens. Hi, this is Brian Adams. Hi, this is Melanie C with Alan on Night Owls. Call Alan Robson's Night Owls now. 0191 488 3188. This is Real Life Conversation with the voice of the North. And my dog McNair sent me an email wondering what's the last day for Cash for Kids donations to be in. It'll be this week. Uh, all the radio stations are all the radio stations involved in it, just those that belong to the same company. And he says, Things to fear, Alan. Nothing much to fear in this world. No, the next never seen a ghost, never experienced anything at all. The only thing that ever freaked me out, I'll tell you, is a little story. I was totally asleep one night, but dreaming I was in bed and I wasn't in my room. I looked at the window to the right of my side of the bed and it was slightly open. I said, there's something in the room. I know it was one of those Japanese girls with long black hair in a nightie with no face. So <laughs> as I looked around the room slowly and turning left, the freak jumped at me, but I was ready and I grabbed it by the neck. My wife at the time woke me and I was screaming with my arm in the air. I thought that I'd got it before it got me. Great show. And hopefully in the new year, we'll be listening every night again. Mad dog, I would love to think that would be the case. Thank you kindly, the mad dog. And a couple of other very quick fiery things. Ben, my born. I'm scared of when DJs redline the mixer and you're on next. Love the show, as always. No, absolutely. Back in the day when I was doing a lot of the live club stuff, they used to have a thing called a lighthouse. And it looked just like a lighthouse. And it had colours. Started off like yellow, then blue, then green, then orange. Then the one at the very top of the lighthouse was red. And if your volume hit the red bit... It cut all the power off. Oh, nightmare. However, we found a way around it. Instead of plugging it to the amplifier, which you're supposed to do, we plugged it to the mixer, which never got above green, and we could blow the roof off the place. And also political comment. And this one is from Tony. All I have to say about the election result is politicians should never ignore the will of the people. And don't feel too sorry for Corbyn. He's got a few million to retire on. Says Tony, I ain't no worries. I don't worry about any of them. I'm just stunned that even in the North, um, everybody's embraced conservatism for, with a bloke who tells more lies than you. It's unbelievable. My head can't get around it. It was the same when Trump got elected in America. Does not compute. Does not compute. Does, you know what I mean? Just doesn't. I, I still can't get my head around it. Let's crack on because we've got Rich and he's in Stockton. Hello, Rich. Hello, Alan. Hello, mate. Good to talk to you. What you got for us tonight, then? Yeah, this is a rarity because I've come on the second week in a row. You know I like to miss a few to give other people a chance. But <laughs> right. I just want to finish off because you remember last week, you cut, well, you didn't cut me off, but you had to go to an ad break. Sure. But the very last last point I was going to make... Oh, go on, then. Yeah. 
Uh, do you know that uh, terrorist fellow, the one that went berserk on the London Bridge, you know, and yes. the, police, the police shot him? Yes. Uh, what I wanted to ask, uh, do you know when the police, like, obviously the police went in, they shot him, killed him because of what he was doing and all the rest of it? Yeah. So basically they did a really good thing. Well, I, I think they did a good thing because mm. God knows what would have happened. Sure. Why do, why do the police always get reported to the Police Complaints Commission and there's an investigation when they've done something like that, which is obviously a good thing? <sighs> You know what the, I mean, don't I, you? I do absolutely, but the the police themselves take it very seriously when they take a life of any kind. That's what they say. So therefore, before anybody else comes forward and says, I don't think that was a legal shooting, because they have to prove to society, I suppose, to prove to all of us that it was a legal shoot. Now, if you look at what happened... There's one guy trying to hold him at bay with a fire extinguisher, while another guy with a narwhal tusk, of all things, is prodding him. Give a... Um, yeah. <laughs> but, he, but he was supposed to have, uh, a, like, a vest that looked like one of those uh, bomb vests, you know? That's, that's right, yeah. So when the guy, when the policeman raced forward with a gun, in, in no time at all, well done to them, um, the guy said he's wearing a... A jacket. He's wearing a bomb. Shoot him before he can. He can. Job was done. I don't know yeah. what more the police could do because, arguably, if the police had said, "Okay, stand back. I'll deal with this. Let's have a conversation for twenty minutes." Um, you only need a split second if that really was a bomb vest. And also the fact that he's wearing one. Uh, I wouldn't take a risk. I wouldn't risk somebody that I loved for, for that. Would you? Definitely not. I, I, when I say about the, you know, they get reported. To, well, they report themselves more often than yeah, not, and you much. know, and I, I don't mean just for like, well, not that any run of the mill shooting. I'm trying to say it carefully, you know, like no, but they I do. They but, do it for all of them as a matter of course, yeah, and then I just, I just mean for that particular situation when it was obviously mm. caught on camera by loads of people. It was witnessed what he'd done. We knew it was him and the suicide, mm. for albeit fake, he didn't know at the time and all that. I just wondered it just I just thought it seemed a bit I know it's a life and he you know sure. but because of what he did and all the rest of it, it I just thought it seemed a bit of a waste of money and resources to to investigate something like that I know? just I just but, think what it'll mean is that investigation will fly past the people's desks they'll just probably go stamp stamp signature done however the, yeah. there's others that you you know every now and then you hear Somebody had a gun on an estate. Oh, it wasn't really a gun. It was actually a cucumber. And he's, yeah. been, he's been shot because he was waving around like a gun. It was under his coat. We can't take yeah. a chance. Yeah, the, every time there is yeah. a shooting, you, the, the police like to take it through the procedure, make sure it was, you know, there was, it was yeah. a good reason, carry on, crack on. I, I think yeah. that they're in one of those positions that if it was a member of your family... And you came forward and said, "Well, he just had mental health issues." Could you could you yeah. see how possibly then then you yeah. think, "Oh, well, he, he wasn't actually a terrorist. He was he just had mental health issues." Yeah. The, the police are in a difficult position, depending on what happens yeah. after after the you know the guns being fired. That's the thing. Yeah, it was just like I say, the thing that like basically nailed it for me when I when I thought, well, it, it you know like the resources and all the rest of it. I thought, mm. well. It, it was that fake suicide belt that nailed it for me. I thought, well, what yeah. they're supposed to do? Because if they didn't do it, when it was real and, like, and half a dozen people got blew up there, you know what I mean? For sure. Like, you know what I mean? That's that's what I was getting at. And I just I just thought it seemed a bit like, you know, obviously it's going whatever, but like you say, if it just flies past the, te the desk, so. stamp, stamp, stamp. I mean, that, that's a fair yeah. comment. Like, I, I, just, I just wondered why they end up something like that so obvious. As to why, you know, people are saying, oh, why did you shoot? And so, you know, something so obvious as that, why then a particular situation like that ended up getting getting reported mm -hmm. by themselves, you know, obviously they reported yeah. themselves to it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's yeah. just, just if, if they nail the inquiry before anybody says, hey, hang on a second, let's look at this, <laughs> because there's always somebody yeah. that will. Do you, yeah. know, do you know what I mean? Human nature being what it is, there's always somebody yeah. that's not happy about it. And oh, no, you see, yeah. to me, and I, I can't get out of my head, anybody that believes, and, I mean, people are free to believe what they want. Religion is one of those things that you always get into trouble talking about. But to me, yeah. anybody who genuinely believes killing innocent people will get them 25 virgins 
uh, in heaven for the rest of uh, infinity. Oh, yeah. Anybody who actually believes that needs you know, needs to be sat down and talked to. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Be because oh, yeah. it, it, it's to me that is. It's 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 just honestly, I, but mind you, I could say that about certain bits of Christianity and Judaism and a, and pretty much every other faith on earth. There's something what that is, you say. Do you really believe that when there's all a, this proof to you know to I the know. contrary? What amazes me about that, you know, you're going to get a load of virgins and all the rest of it, is like you know, like the so-called like uh, I you know well call it what is it dia diash. What are, you know, the nasty people, bosses sort of thing. Mm. They say, they say to these suicide bombers, I'll oh, go and do this and you'll end up getting all this. You'd think they'd turn around and say, well, why don't you do it if it's that good? <laughs> well, this you is know it, what but, I mean? But, but they never do. No, because they've been kind of groomed from being either, either young or being stupid, one or the other, they've been groomed to realise that uh, this is what you do, look, and we'll give your family some money. Every week, we look after your family. Don't you worry about that. Because you can't look after them. You haven't got a job or anything. So what we'll do is we'll put a vest on you. You'll end up going up to heaven and uh, the prophet will be there and you'll get all these women and you'll be looked oh, yeah. after. And, you, and if you if you say that to a stupid person long enough... Yeah. I just... My, like like yours, my man just can't can comprehend. Can it, <laughs> what, you know, I mean, I wouldn't do that for all the money in the world. And Well, no the bottom line is if you're that... If you're that... If you're that desperate for a woman, you know, like 50 quid to 100 quid, I could get you sorted. Do you know what I mean? You just yeah. got to make a phone call to the right kind of woman who's up for a, you know, who's up for a, a financial debate. I mean, how much would it cost for you to, oh, well, you'll do it for that one. Here's a guy, sort him out. Do you know, yeah. if, if that's all yeah. it takes. And anyway, everybody knows that you wouldn't want a virgin anyway, would you? You'd want somebody that kind of knew what they yeah. were doing. I mean, <laughs> Well, wouldn't would you? Yeah. I think you, I think you probably would. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. All right. I think that's a good time for me to go. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> before I say something wrong, <laughs> thank I you. I don't want you to cut me off. You never have, and I don't want you to. No <laughs> worries. Thanks a lot, mate. Great to hear from you. All me. right. I'll be back. You take care. Oh, by the way, Alan, did you get me card? I haven't yet, but I must say that the the postal service this year has been bizarre. But it, it will be here, and the fact that I only come in on a Sunday yeah. kind of makes it announced difficult. But I will make sure that I check, because I'm in again tomorrow. You, it's a, well, I know you've probably got a lot more than that, but I just I like to know you got it. That's all right. Bless you. Thanks a lot, Richard. Great. I'm glad you sent one. Thank you, mate. All right. You take care, mate, and all I will be on every night of the week next year. Well, bless you. Thank you, man. Anne's been on, and sad news. You know, last week we were just talking about Eleanor and Bernadette, two, two absolute classic callers. Bernadette has just told Anne that Eleanor has died. So, so sad. So many people were asking about the two of them. Thank you very much for, for letting me know. They, so we will dedicate tonight's show to Bernadette and Eleanor because they were just, they were just the best. I remember we wrote a comedy song called Bernadette's Mother, if you remember, which was a, a a Mickey take. And they were just spectacular people, Eleanor and Bernadette. And sadly, Eleanor has left us. My goodness. <sighs> what a damn shame. 0191 Love to Bernadette if she's listening. My goodness, how awful. And we knew that she'd been ill over a long period of time. Uh, always hoping for the best, but it's uh, not to be the case. We got George from Lanchester up next. Hello, George. Good evening, my man. Hello to you. I, I was interested about these uh, twenty-five virgin creatures. <laughs> uh, does does the the person concerned have to marry them? No, they just go to heaven and, and presumably um, take advantage of them. I don't know oh. whether the virgins in heaven have a say. Well, I'm presuming uh, they they would if they were in heaven. Well, but of course, uh, if if marriage is involved, just think that's that's all these bloody mother-in-laws as well. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, it's it's a it's a it's a sad thing. It's yeah, a sad thing. It is indeed. That, uh, to to go around murdering people, you've got to be promised this, that, and and obviously plenty of the other. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's it's strange. 
But there you go. I don't know of any religion that uh, in one way or another hasn't slaughtered millions. That's a fact. That's a fact right there, man. Yeah. Right. On a brighter note, I have <laughs> got a I have got a little limerick for you. Oh, good man. Yes, here we go. There was a young man of Bombay who took a slow boat to China one day. He was chained to the tiller with a sex-starved gorilla, and China's a bloody long way. Hey, nice one. I will have to, if anybody else has got a good limerick, let's limerick us. It's Christmas. Uh, it's better yeah. than a Christmas cracker joke. I like limericks better. Well, I, I think, I think, uh, <laughs> and believe it or not, I, I, I heard that on a very old Ken Dodd show. Right. So, you know, and it, it stuck in my mind. I thought that was very witty. I like that. That's a good one. I mean, there's a, there's a few classics over the way, and there was one. There once was a man from Dodd. Oh, I can't remember it. There once was a man from Darjeeling. <laughs> now I can't remember it. Oh, what's that? Well, I know, I know a lot, but I certainly couldn't repeat them on no, this program. That's that's the worry, really. That that is the worry, and yeah. some of them are very, very clever. The way the way they they worded, but it it's uh, it's it's not for this guy. Yeah, I'm going to program. leave the man from Nantucket alone. I'm going to well, leave. I'm going to walk past him. Well, yes, yeah, yeah, and and there's there's a lot, a lot like it. Uh, and uh, as I say, some of them actually are very clever. Yeah, the, for sure. The, the way they worded and twists on words. But there you go. We'll 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 have to invent a, another radio program. Absolutely. Hey, tell me a little bit about Christmas back in your day when you were a little boy. What was it like? How does it differ back well, then? Well, um, when I was. Uh, Four and a half, I went to my first uh, school for blind children, which had been evacuated to uh, Grange over Sands. And the first Christmas I remember, we we were, uh, and I wasn't quite five then. Right. Nice. Uh, there was a, a lot of young men arrived with beautifully made wooden toys. Mm. And uh, when I was older, I... I uh, understood that, in fact, they were German prisoners of war. Right. And uh, they, they came to the school, as I say, with these beautifully made uh, wooden toys. And uh, they, they were just the same as us, you know. They, 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 they weren't uh, Nazi types. They, they mm. probably didn't want to fight. They were probably relieved to be over here as prisoners. Right. I would think, right. but right. they right. they they were really uh, decent people, mm. and uh, the other memory I have of that Christmas, of course, all all the staff uh, were armed. All the male members of staff right. always had rifles with them and and whatever. And uh, the first Christmas tree <laughs> had had real candles on it, wow. and, and, wow. and uh, of course there weren't any electric. Uh, uh, lights uh, for Christmas trees then. Uh, there were just these miniature candles that were clipped onto the branches. <laughs> and you, like... you wonder, uh, nationally, <laughs> how many houses got burned down? I bet. But, uh, yeah, it was... Uh, that, that was that was good. But, I mean, is it traditionally always... You, you don't open a present until it's Christmas morning itself? How did, how did that kind of thing work? Because in various parts of the world, some people give presents on December the 6th. Yeah. Others do it Christmas Eve. How was and it done back in the day? Uh, and originally, of course, Boxing Day was when the Christmas presents were opened. Right. The boxes were opened. Yes, sir. And, uh, but, uh, and, and of course, uh, everybody knows very well that the, these days, well, and for many years past, mm. when you were adult, people gave you presents, you know, Really interesting presents like socks and hankies uh, and and uh, the kind the kind of uh, aftershave and whatever that uh, you would immediately put in a bin or or in, or or give it to a charity shop or something. Right. I mean, did, did you ever get uh, really gross presents when when uh, you were growing up? Yeah. You know, oh yeah. I mean, I, I mentioned this before on the show that. Uh, my parents used to buy me stuff from car boot sales, 
And uh, I, I suppose, well, you know, they were pensioners for heaven's sake, so they didn't have a lot of money. Uh, but I used to open my mum's Christmas, my mum and dad's Christmas present on Christmas Eve because I knew if I opened it on Christmas, I'd really get annoyed. Yeah. And what are you... <laughs> You've got it over with. Get it, get it out the way, put it in the bin. And what it used to be was you'd get a bottle of aftershave but the first quarter of an inch is gone, you yeah. know, because yeah, somebody tried it and had gone, oh, I'm not wearing yeah. that, and then sold it on a car boot sale stall or, or whatever. And the very last gift that I got off my parents before they passed was a stainless steel coffee set, dented. Everything we had a dent and <laughs> scratches in it. And <laughs> the actually coffee pot itself, the spout was kind of bent to one side. And inside the coffee pot, there was still bits of coffee lying around from the last person who'd... who'd yeah, they'd um, obviously been well used, and uh, when they thought, oh, it's a bit monkey now, well, let's get rid of it. And my parents thought, that's just what our Alan would do. And you think, wonder where, how, what could they, they... So the first thing it was, it was like, you opened it, you looked in, I stared in... The coffee pot itself, looking down and smelling the yeah. that had been in there for oh, months, yes. and I just bundled the whole thing up. You walk to the back door, lift open the top of the bin, clunk. Yeah, and, and then the next day you said, "Oh, thanks for the present." Well, that was lovely. Great. Did you get? Did you get my this? And the funny thing, I don't know whether you've ever had this kind of problem with with parents from back in the day. I always used to try really hard to make sure that I got them something that was like, ta da! Yeah. It was something that was that would really say, "Oh, Merry Christmas!" Not just socks. I did the sock stuff when I was a little kid, but when I got up a bit, I was saying, "Is there something that you would like? You know, is there something that would make your life easier? Is there is there something that you've really looked forward to that you've not managed to get?" And this is absolutely true. I went on a holiday, and my dad said I'd quite like a leather. Jacket, not a not like a baker's jacket or anything. No. You know, a coat, yeah, but made of leather. And I thought, swanky for me, Dad. Mean. So I says, give me your exact fitting. And he gave me the exact fitting. And when I was abroad, I think I was somewhere like Cyprus. And you see these places where you can buy a leather handbag designed and made especially for you. We yeah. also made jackets. We can do them for as little as yeah. And uh, it was coppers in comparison with what I would have to pay in Britain. So I paid the extra money, brought it back home, because obviously holiday is middle of the year, so it's it's in a plastic thing, but yeah, I know I've got him exactly what he wants. Took it over, Christmas Eve all wrapped up. There you go, Merry Christmas. He opened it up on Christmas Day and said, uh, oh, you can take that coat back, Alan. And I, I, I what? Because I, obviously I couldn't take the... Well, <laughs> it's no. It's not, Obviously, it's been made in a particular size. So, you, I mean, even if I, if that shop was around the corner, I still couldn't take it back. So I said, well, what's the matter with it? He says, I've put on a, a little bit of weight so I, I, it doesn't fit. So you can you can take it back. I says, I don't want your jacket. That's give You give it to somebody else. And you know how this is yeah. Christmas Day and it should be uh, love and all, yes. all of that. But it, it's like... Because I did everything right, or I thought I did. Yeah. And uh, I says, "Look, I'm going to come. I will take that back." And I remember taking it back, and I took it straight around the Boxing Day to a charity shop and said, "There, make a few bob on that sunshine." And uh, and that was it. But that was the last time. I, I thought from then on, you know, you go the extra yard. It, it patently isn't worth it because they're just looking for a reason to. To kind well, of knock you well, down. If it was in actual fact he had put on extra weight and it didn't fit him, I'd have said, Right, you are going to spend three months in a trauma <laughs> and you will not come out. I know for a fact, but I, I know for a fact he, what he hadn't put on the weight yeah. that he's talking about. Uh, it just, I just couldn't get. It, I'm, I'm, this just sounds horrible that, I, that I'm uh, knocking I'd, me on family. I'd bitterly disappointed after going to all that trouble well, to, to get what I thought was the perfect gift. No, absolutely. It always seemed to be the case when I was a kid that they always looked towards my sister for being, like, the good one, and then there's Alan. It, it always felt like that. And 
it was almost like, well, on purpose, I'll make him feel bad about something that he's done that's a nice thing. And I just don't think, you know, because if somebody had given, gone to that trouble for me, I'd have been all over grateful. I'd have been quite upset by that. I thought, oh, that's a, lo- yeah. what a lovely thing to do. But families, ah, it's never, it's never uh, clear well, cut. Well, I'll tell you what they say, fam- fam- fa- a family Christmas is uh, the ideal setting for a murder. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's there's a little bit of that, and I love the fact that oh, it's great. We'll be able to play board games, and then you you try saying that to a kid who's been on Call of Duty on his computer game, yeah. you know, for for eight hours a day since last month. Crazy. Well, um, <laughs> I'm delighted to say that we we had uh, uh, have had a lot of trouble with a uh, computer. Right. I'm not saying which store we right. got it from or whatever, but was back several times and every time, wow. oh, yeah, we, we put it right, it's fine, and it wasn't. <sighs> and uh, I, I uh, or rather, Hazel rang the manufacturer, and uh, they uh, arranged for the, the computer to be picked up the next day by a courier, taken mm-hmm. back to the uh, manufacturer, mm-hmm. They sorted it out, and two days later, we had it back perfect. Good, great, brilliant. Good. Uh, it's a, all of that stuff is such a clot. It is such a clot. And the thing that tends to happen is before anybody will do anything, you have a, a phone call with somebody who doesn't speak English. They speak computer talk, and they sit you in front of a computer and have you say, well, go to this, press that, go to that, press this, go to that. Uh, and then, like, three hours later, then they, you've completely wasted your day. They say, oh, well, I'm not really sure. <laughs> well, that's the point. That's the exactly. point. I need somebody to fix but, it. I, I must say, uh, when Hazel explained it had been back to the store, they'd had it in, in, in total for a number of weeks. Right, and, right. Uh, they said, well, clearly, you, 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 you've had a, a, a really bad time. Mm. We'll collect it at our expense. Yeah, we'll do no, whatever right. is necessary, and if we can't fix it, we'll replace it. That's pretty and good. Two days later, we got it back, and it, perfect. Brilliant. Hey, good news. Well, you, I'll hopefully talk to you before Christmas, George. Thank you so much for coming on. Always a joy. Yeah, you take care, Alan. Thanks, All the man. best, me old son. And the best to you too. And Christmas greetings from Greatest Hits. Got another Greatest Hit coming your way from a woman that we love because she's as madly northern as the rest of us. And her name's Lisa Stansfield. And you know, we've been talking today about what are you scared of, strange things that you've got a fear about. Lisa Stansfield's got one. What are you frightened of? Are you going to rational or irrational fear? Um, telephones. Why? Uh, because I think the reason why I think is because my mum received the news of her, my grandma, her mother. She received the news of her of my grandma dying oh, over the telephone. Right. And I saw my mum, the reaction that she had yeah. when she just dropped onto her knees. And exactly the same thing happened to me with my mum. Oh, that, good gracious. That I received the news on the telephone. Aye. And I did exactly the same thing that my mum did. So I really don't like answering. I don't mind talking on the telephone if I know <laughs> what I'm talking about. <laughs> but if I have to answer a telephone, I won't answer it. I'll do, like, for anyone else, they can not answer a telephone. Right. It's like something that bugs somebody. I've got Absolutely. to answer it. I said, I can't answer it. I can't answer it. I'll let a telephone ring all day. Yeah, because if you don't answer it, you can't get bad news. Yeah. Right. No, that, and it's crazy. silly. It's irrational. It's like the fear of flying or a fear of spiders. Sure. It's stupid. Really. No, it makes sense. I mean, it just kind of makes sense when you put it into context. But I'm not afraid of a lot of things, but I'm afraid of flying. Right. <laughs> 0191 488 3188. This is Night Owls. Alan Robson with you. Thanks for being with me. Now, don't forget, tomorrow morning, the longest running game is still going. In the morning, Moldy Mystery Oldie, Rossi's got a massive and brand new clue on our Facebook over the weekend. Check that out, plus all of the wrong guesses on our website. And if you get it right, if you can work it out 
you could win over £9,800 tomorrow at 7.30 and also 8.30 on Greatest Hits Radio. And I know some of you who don't have to get up early in the morning, you just put your alarm on for 7.30 then put the alarm on again for 8.30 just so you can get in and give it a go. And I don't blame you at all. So get ready for that with Rossi in the morning. And we have, as promised, Emma from Newcastle. Hello, Emma. Hi, Aaron. Hello, darling. How are you doing? Not too great. What's been happening? I gather you've been in and out of the hospital. I have, yeah. I had a cyst on my stomach and I had septicemia as well. Oh, blame it. Well, what that means is when you've gone in with the first problem, they've given you a second problem, haven't they? That's, that's essentially yeah. what that is. So uh, if, how are you doing with the septicemia then? Um, <laughs> I, I've got th- a total th- rest. I'm actually home, oh, but I've got a total rest. Right, I bet you have. It's a but terrifying thing. Your boyfriend's been brilliant. No, that's good. My mother had suffered septicemia when she had her hospital thing done, and uh, the hospital problem she had was dealt with in about four days, and it took about seven months for the septicemia to sort itself out. So, uh, but they wanted to stay for. Between eight and uh, between seven and eight days, and I oh. said, "No, I'm coming. I'm yeah. coming back home." So, what have you got to do there? That's that's super careful, then. Uh, just not do anything heavy. Right. Okay. And uh, the boyfriend's doing a, a grand job of looking after you. Then I'm hearing. Yeah. Yes. Ah, that's good news. Oh, well, how? Well, I mean, because the cyst is the cyst sorted. Then is that finished now? They've actually drained the cyst, but it's been really. Ugh. It's been ongoing. Right, so where it's on your on your tummy, on my stomach, yeah. Oh dear, so it comes up like a boil. I'm guess. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm yeah, I'm, basically. I'm imagining this in my head, and I know it's going to spoil me supper, but I'll do it anyway. So the um right, so it's a, like a big lump. They drain that down, and hopefully allows the body to then take it back to normal. But it's yeah, but this, not... but when I went the other night, it said I still got fluid as well. So you're going to have to get rid of that before you can get rid of it all together? Oh, what a clot. Yeah. What a clot. Just uh, Merry Christmas, you know. That this, <laughs> you, we, we just I know that's all I need. I know. <laughs> well, I mean, last year I was I had uh, hospitalisation just before, the, literally the day before Christmas I was in hospital. And it's the... You look at everybody's face and they're, it's like... They're all in prison and they, they know they, they need to get out of there as quick as they can. Uh, but it's not, but they, you've, they've also got to put you right, that's the thing. So, But you're going back and they're going to sort that out while you're still at home, though, which is which is something, I suppose. But I've got district nurses coming out every other day to just change the dressing. Right. <laughs> Clark. Stinky and clarty, I'm guessing. Yeah, basically. Ah, <laughs> uh, not great. Hey, well, we're thinking of you, Emma. Thank you for coming on, telling us about it. Fingers crossed, it'll, by the time the new year comes, you'll be up and at them for the party. What's your radio station? Because we can't find it on the telly. It's Greatest Hits Radio Northeast, is what we are. It's Greatest Hits Northeast. It oh. is. You can't find it on the um, telly. I don't. I don't know why we're not there. We should be there somewhere. Uh, I'll check into that over the next week for you. Thanks for coming okay, on, thank Ems. You, All thank the best, love. Bye bye. And uh, I don't know why we're, we're not there. Surely we should be. We demand to be there. Now, earlier on, we were talking about the terrorist on the bridge. And Chris came in with two points I just didn't get a, a chance to tell you about. His first point was Hi, Alan. Much like the army, the police have very specific rules of engagement. And the police complaints investigate to make sure that those very specific rules weren't broken. Makes absolute sense. Thank you very much, Chris. Oh, but that wasn't the end of him. He bounced back and he said, me again. Anybody committing terrorist acts these days needs to realise Hugh Hefner has been up there in heaven a while now. There will be no virgins left. And that's <laughs> that's from Chris the Truck. Thank you, Chris. There you go. <laughs> Brilliant. A piece of Christmas, a joyful lump of Christmas uh, that I think many a man would quite fancy in their Christmas stocking. That's Kaylee. And after Kaylee, we are talking to somebody very special. His name's Fred. He's from 
first dates. You've seen him on the television. He's wonderful. We had a question two weeks ago, you will remember, where somebody talked about they wanted some tips on hosting and they're going to have a party, but what should you do? What should you put out? How should you behave? So I thought, well, who better to ask? Because Fred's done, you know, he's like the king of restaurateurs. He knows how to organise parties and the, the best way to get people together. We're talking to Fred after a very nice saucy slice of Kaylee. How about that? Pretty good. CNC Music Factory. And we zap. So one thing I haven't done is give you a second clue that could win you the Alan Robson Night Owls mug, courtesy of Greatest Hits, and you also get the sleeping bag, the rucksack, and the cap from the new movie Jumanji with The Rock and all those other people in it. So to win all of that, clue number one is this. The day before Christmas, write that down, that's one clue. Second clue, the film about the pig who thought he was a sheepdog. You write down that word. He has two more clues. A word that means inebriated. A word that means inebriated. And a military vehicle once built and stood outside Vickers Armstrong's on Newcastle's Scotswood Road. A military vehicle once built and stood outside Vickers Armstrong's along Scotswood Road. So you've got two clues, then two more clues. So you'll get another two clues before the end of the show. And then you tell me what they all have in common. And I think you will know. The Fognogs have been on. Alan, we're back after a run of illness and various other family things. So sorry to hear about Eleanor. Sending love to Bernadette. Hopes all, all's well with you. Lots of love, the fog knocks. Cheers. Uh, great to hear from you. And yes, awful about that. We lost one of our number over the last week. Also, Ted says, please air this message. Robbie Williams saved my life. I would be dead if it wasn't for him. I was rehabbed and I now know what he went through. I did it. It was awful. So well done, Ted. Great to have you back with us. And also, Harvey, we've been talking about things that frighten you. Harvey says, Alan, I'm scared of lifts. I got stuck in one once. I was absolutely terrified. The five minutes I was stuck felt like a lifetime. It was awful. I now make every excuse not to use them. The positive thing is I'm now really fit from all the stairs that I climb. That's yours, Harvey. Harvey, thanks a lot. Right, let's head across to concert up there, mountains, where we find Sean. Hi, Sean. I tell you what scares me, Boris. <laughs> Boris Karloff. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you think he looks like Barney Rubble out of Flintstone? He does a bit, and, actually, Boris uh, Johnson. I tell right. you what, hey, I'm absolutely fuming. This is what frightened me, I tell you. Tory MP run concert. That's a, it's a different world out there. What are we going to do? I don't understand it, mainly. But do you understand... You know, you know these people that voted Brexit, right? Mm -hmm. They never won one seat that the Brexit is, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was like it was like saying, oh, give us your vote, mm -hmm. like, for the Tories. Well, and that's you what know, it is. 30 years ago, he used to be a Tory MP. Mm-hmm. Who's Farage. that? Farage. Who? Farage. Oh, he, used to be a, he used to be a, a Tory MP in the Thatcher era. Right, OK. Right. So... Uh, bottom bottom line, it, it is what it's going to be. I'm, I'm interested to see which way it'll go and hoping for the best, but expecting the worst. But you but, never know. I mean, the first the first bloke that they ever they got on the phone to him, congratulated him. Who do you think that was? <laughs> was that Donald? He was his pal from America, wasn't it? Uh, I cannot wait to do... Uh, business with you. Business with you. I heard that, but the, the funny thing was that he said that uh, originally about, oh, blame me, it'd be, be about nine months ago, probably before the, the last major problem that Boris had. Uh, and About the NHS? He said that just before the NHS thing became an issue, and then, of course, they found all the documentation saying that Boris had had all these secret meetings and sending people over on... Well, they had a programme about it on the television, man. How, to, how to flog the National Health Service to the Americans who want it, because if they can get control of that, they can charge whatever they like for, you know, prescriptions and, and medicines and what have you. Uh, and they would have they would have Great Britain by the scrotum, essentially. So, 
Uh, who knows what's going to happen? But it's just what I don't understand is in putting Brexit to one side, if you could, and I only really wish I could just put it to one side, uh, he's lied and lied and lied and lied and of course lied. He has, mate. And he hasn't said anything remotely that's come true about anything that he said. And he still got voted in, which shows you how bad the Labour Party must have been, and presumably uh, the SDP and everybody else. The well, Corbyn, Corbyn won his seat by 26,000 votes, so how the hell can they turn around and say, oh, it wasn't Corbyn that did it, you know what I mean? Right. Well, I, hey, but, bottom line is, uh, they've gone with the will of the people, <laughs> and to be honest, it probably took them three years too long to get there, but they, they seem to have got there. We still haven't got a deal with Europe yet. But they're saying no, we'll be sorted in a month. I don't think we'll ever get a deal. I think Europe will turn around and say, look, just fend for yourselves. Don't bother about us. I think that's what's going to happen. Well, uh, a no deal Brexit is a definite possibility still because uh, uh, the the interesting thing about it is that Boris has said, oh, well, we've got Ireland sorted. But the people in Ireland who have to vote on it said, no, you don't. Mm -hmm. We've not agreed a thing. But, uh, and once again, it gets down to... I can see there being a hard border, you know. Uh, well, if there is, then the whole Irish thing might kick off again, and that's one thing and we don't want. One thing we don't want, no. no but sure. what about these Russian papers, like? You know, that they were scared of... Yeah. Well, I mean... This... Before the general election. Well, the same thing happened in America, where they sent, you know, like 10 million emails and faxes and messages to people to try and persuade them to vote Donald Trump in, uh-huh. and all sent from Russia. They did the same thing about Brexit. But however, they've had a vote. You know, we've had a, an election. People voted, and uh, I, I kind of knew what was going to happen. And I ended up not voting again because I was thinking I could vote for Jeremy Corbyn, but I don't think he's the right bloke for Labour anyway, personally. Yeah, I mean, they, they could have just turned around and said, right, we'll vote for him. And if we didn't like them after three months, just get rid of them and get somebody um, else in. Well, you see, I'm not sure that they would do that because if if he got in, if he won, even uh, if he was holding, you know, the the power between him and the Scots here, uh, or him and the Lib Dems, I still think that uh, I, I'm not sure whether I, I I understood a lot of the things that he stood for, and some of them were quite nice things to stand for. I did I couldn't see how he would balance his books, so I couldn't go the Jeremy Corbyn way. No. And I couldn't go the conservative way because I, I never have in my life. Uh-huh. And uh, I've just... They've been in for nine years. Has it been a good nine years for you? It's been the worst of the worst, isn't it, when you think of it? And we've had all of that austerity because of them. And people We're never going to get rid of that, you know. And people have voted to them in massively, so now they feel they can do whatever the hell they like. So, ooh, I mean, let's I'd see like what to, happens. I'd like to know what... The, he said he was going to... Uh, tell everybody what was in the Russian papers, you know. Yeah. Them, because he wouldn't do it before the election. Don't hold your breath. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but then, then, then you turn around and say to the, 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 the which I call them backstabbers. Like I, I really mm. call the Labour lot backstabbers now. Like. Oh, they've really turned on them, haven't they? You know what I mean? The last, the last twenty-four hours, it's been fierce. But uh, that's what happens if you. The world loves a winner. They don't like losers. That's the way that it's, uh, it kicks. Yeah, I cannot see. I cannot see. But who would have thought all the... I mean, 20 years ago, the thought of Labour in concert, a Labour in Northumberland, a Labour in, in Newcastle, a Labour in Sunderland, or Teesside. Hartley Pool in the... Oh, dear me. Yeah, you that's where it's... You believe it, like. It's just... It's such... If somebody had come forward who was new uh-huh. and told the truth... And uh-huh. did what they said they were going to do. Yeah. I would say, everybody should get, irrespective of your party, get behind this honest man. Yeah. Kind of just kind of say that with Boris. You just can't say that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but Boris seems always have been to do what's best for Boris, and it'll be interesting to see that he's now in a position, better position than he's ever been in politically. Uh-huh. It's up to him to live up to it now, and. Uh, I, I mean, think it's going to be been, interesting. He's only been an MP for since uh, 2015. Mm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's crazy putting somebody in that doesn't even know what two plus two is. 
Well, it's just we, we, Britain and America have something in common at oh, the I moment. Think, I think I think that's what's going to happen. If, uh, if we've got cartoon leaders. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly think that's what's going to happen now. And I, I, I really think we're going to go down the American way. Like. Mm. Well, time will tell. Hey, lovely hearing from you, Sean. Take care, Sean. And all the best to you, man. Thanks for coming on. Do you know I think it's time for something we call the blog. So what is the blah? Well, it's when we have a chat about everything. But before that, something very important. I have to say hi to Kirsty, who's been on a date. Hmm? And Kirsty, for those of you that uh, go back far enough, she was the lady that we took on a ghost and who was punched by a ghost. And it's one of those things that, yeah, that was right. She got punched by a ghost. I was there. And... Uh, Great to hear from you, Kirsty. Have a great Christmas, lass, and hope the date works out for you. There you go. The Blah. We always start with whatever's texting, whatever's trending. I'm joined by bro, um, producers of the stars, Hollywood McShane. What were you going to call us there? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> and also we have Nicola, of course, who is the, uh, the absolute building block of Night Owls. There you are. <laughs> And uh, everybody says, what a block she is. <laughs> and, uh, well, let's have a look, see what's happening. Monday is National Newspaper Front Pages, and we start with the sun. Heist shock. How about that? Do you know Tamara's £50 million pounds worth of jewels have gone in 50 minutes? Who's Tamara? A lightning raid on an heiress's mansion. Well, she's in the sun, so she's obviously got breasts. And uh, <laughs> she's wearing a sparkly dress... <laughs> Because that's all she's got left, because all her jewels have gone. Ooh. She's a rich heiress with lots of, lots of, presumably, presumably, insured. Yep. So she'll get her £50 million back. Could be an inside job. I'm guessing. Well, don't start that. <laughs> there's, there's our first, <laughs> that's our first litigation of the this year. This is the law. Right. <laughs> no, that's, no that, that, that's just... <laughs> Gossip. <laughs> Let's move past that one as quickly as we can. See, Daily Star. Love Isle shocker. Star gets flack. Her ex posts pictures of a gag order. Um, Caroline Flack? Oh, uh, yeah, she got done for assault, didn't you? And apparently there's mm -hmm. a, there's pictures of her front door um, surround mm -hmm. with bloodstains wow. on it. So it obviously... I wonder what he'd done um, for um, that. Or what she did to him for... Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, what... what he done for her to do that. <laughs> <laughs> what? What did what did he do for her to do that? I don't know what I meant. Right. Okay. <laughs> well, just proof you say that domestic violence can go either way. Well, it's, exactly. Doesn't always have to be the gadgy. The Times Johnson to take aim at the Ministry of Defence over wasted cash and two apples a day keep heart disease away. How much fruit do you eat, you know? Maybe a banana a day. <laughs> it's two apples you need. See, some days I eat quite a bit, and then some days I don't. It's just as whenever I get time. Which we, five a day we're supposed to have, aren't I we? Know. Yeah, I eat a lot of vegetables, though. Right, OK. Don't, don't know whether that makes up for it, but you're still going to die of heart disease. Right, <laughs> Daily Mirror. Uh, Labour verdict. Mirror readers have their say on the party's election nightmare, because that's the only Labour newspaper. All the other papers are Tory. Uh, gift of life from the National Health Service superhero. A radiographer deno de donates her own kidney to a little girl she didn't know after seeing her mum's play. That's a lovely, that's a lovely thing. And you can see the, the girl and her mummy, uh, the girl with the little the wire up her nose and everything. Ah, that is super sweet. That's a nice story on the front page. Uh, the Guardian rivals poised as battle for Labour's future begins... And Discord at Climate Talks branded a betrayal. They have climate talks, but you've got people there like China and America who don't believe it. So they're saying, no, uh, everything's all right the way that it is, and everybody else is saying, we're going to die. In uh, other words, they're big masks in China because it's so... Well, yes, but they still feel that fossil fuels is the way because they're further down... You know how we had a big industrial revolution from about 1880 onwards. The Chinese are kind of going through a bit of that now. So they're still using fossil fuels, and I, I don't think that they could cut down, even if they actually 
if they actually wanted to. But that's The Guardian with your guide to a green Christmas, if you wanted that. The Daily Mail, blueprint for Boris's Britain. The Prime Minister will put border control, the National Health Service and investment in the North at the heart of a bid to govern for another decade. And Linick has own goal on Ben Stokes' big night. He was missing from match of the day on Saturday night because it was also the night of sports personality of the yeah. year. And Ben Stokes got it. Do you know what he does? G- cricketer. Cricketer. There you go, good man. Apparently he gave the na- game away because he dropped him in it and said he'd won at the start of the show and then people had to vote in. As well, so the, it's obvious oh, the winner had already been picked. Been, oh, naughty so, poo. Yeah, there's um, no, hell on. Naughty, naughty poo. Information newspaper Labour MPs attack Corbyn as the battle for the party's future begins. They were all kicking seven shades out of him in every news bulletin I've heard since. since the, it's funny because they were all kind of. He's amazing, he's incredible, he's the man to lead us, he's, uh, he's uh, insightful and thoughtful, he can see in the future. And uh, he'll be a footnote. By March, because he says he's going to stand down. I think he should go now if he's going to go at all. But he says, no, he'll wait and he'll, he'll try and help the person. It's a, That's a dodgy thing. If, if you've lost by that much, there is a door. Uh, the Daily Telegraph, Labour war as stupid voters get the blame. They claim that uh, Thornbury uh, called Northern voters stupid for voting for Brexit. Now, time will tell whether that is actually true or false, I suppose, because the Tories have tried desperately to win the North for 100 years, pretty much, and they've never got close. Boris has persuaded them to do it, and Boris is not the most truthful person in the world. So uh, were the Brexiteers stupid or not? Time will tell on that one. That's the only way you can really put it. Then there's a picture of Ben Stokes holding his award. Uh, Daily Express, Stokes, the hero again, cricket star as sports personality of the year, and Boris war with the BBC over TV licence fees. He planned to decriminalise those who don't pay. And also a picture, please keep on dancing Anton, because there's the risk that Anton Dubeck won't be kept on by the strict... Because he's never won, has he? No. Um, And I, I, I must say... Don't really care uh, in, in, in to any large degree. Did you watch Strictly with the guy no. from EastEnders? Won it? I watched you, the last um, I thought it was Emma Dale. Oh, Emma, Emma Dale. Dale yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, it was I don't Emma watch Dale, it anyway. I knew it was but I know story. who it is. Yeah. Yeah, the rough-looking one from Emma Dale, yes. who, who's got like a. But he was the farmer, body. wasn't he? Apparently. Wasn't he? I don't know. I don't really watch it. <laughs> <laughs> We shouldn't comment on stuff we've got no idea what we're doing. <laughs> Financial Times, the United Nations talks on climate change break up in stalemate. That's the big story from the Financial Times. The Metro newspaper, the first half, strictly come dancing with a very smiling person who came out of the after show party looking damaged. They all look pretty damaged. And Labour at each other's throats. And... Uh, there are two Labour MPs fighting, and one of them is uh, Emily Thornbury, who called Northern voters stupid, or claimed to. And uh, they're all at each other's throats over that as well. That is the newspapers that's going to get rammed through your letterbox in the morning. Over to you there, Nicola. What you got for us? So 2020 is nearly here. Yeah. And apparently there's an awful new dating trend setting off. So I have not heard of any of these I've asked Tony he's heard of none of them but we've heard of catfishing uh, ghosting and stuff like that <laughs> yeah but mm-hmm. apparently there's flea <clears throat> pegging is that one possibly no I don't, I don't know. know it's not on our list <laughs> I've heard list. of that though I'm trying to think <laughs> what it is <laughs> <laughs> somebody mentioned pegging and I'm just thinking well that must be one of them new things I've heard of that well there's flea bagging Ooh. what's flea bagging then when you consistently go after people who are completely wrong for you Oh, so, I've lived that life. Like a hot priest. That's what it says. Think of a hot priest. Don't go for the hot priest. Don't That's go for the saying. hot priest. <laughs> no a randy nun, perhaps, <laughs> but a hot priest, nay. <laughs> There's dial toning, which is when you give somebody th- your number and you say to text them, but then you don't bother. Right. Which is, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say that's dial toning. <laughs> it's just... Don't you just give them your number with a number missing? I just give them a false number, mm. yeah. Yeah. 
your false number, you've obviously got one. <laughs> well, you just rhyme anything after. Oh, dear. <laughs> one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> We've got yellow carding. What's yellow carding? Where you're calling someone out for their poor dating etiquette and telling them that you're not happy with what they've done. Well, that's good. Give them a yellow card mm. and then say, mm. if, you don't, if you don't change your ways, I'll give you a red one. We've got... <laughs> <laughs> if you put the expression. <laughs> <laughs> or a green one. <laughs> We've got exoskeleton. Tony's got just, no impact. Just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Do that again, um, I'll give you a red one. Right, OK. <laughs> I'm not going to read that one. No, come on, tell I'll us. Do a red one. Uh, eclipsing. What's eclipsing? <laughs> Taking up with someone <laughs> the, same, the same interests and hobbies as the person that you're dating in a bit to have more in common with them. Isn't that good, though? So you like, you just kind of mirroring what they're like, don't you? Mm. No, but if you if you like dogs, you would not go out with somebody because they like dogs. If they and if you, they like the same film as you, then you're gonna sit together and watch a movie together, aren't you? Rather. Well, yeah, but I, I mean, it depends what the class and his interests and hobbies. Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, I think uh, he just wants a red one. <laughs> <laughs> what well, else I then? I don't know. I think that's a bit strange. If you'd say you're, you're turning into them, aren't you? Like morphing into what they're like. Well, you think? Well, I don't know. I, I think people have to have a little bit of something in coming. In common. <laughs> in common. Yeah, but these Don't are making... <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> these are making uh, yeah. themselves into what they are, if you know what I mean. <laughs> right. Oh, hang on so a second. they don't actually have it in common. Pegging is not a gay thing whatsoever. I didn't say that it was. I'm reading from the <laughs> Urban Dictionary, yeah? Uh, no matter how you take it apart and put it back together, pegging is sex between a man and a woman, in other words. Oh, that's pegging. <laughs> Oh, I see what ah! he's just put two. He's t if you hold two fingers out like Churchill, and then you put your other hand as two fingers like Churchill, and then you just put one inside the other. That's pegging. Oh, I've pegged it. I've pegged. <laughs> Not recently, but I've pegged. That's a fact. I thank you for that. So, what else then is up for grabs here? We've got exoskeletoning. Exoskeletoning. Yeah. Yes. So, when your partner's ex keeps reaching out to you via social media. Or through other methods. Well, have either of you been pursued by an ex? No. 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 I've had, I've had a few that that I've that I've divorced that have tried to get back in to my life somehow really? a little oh. bit. Yeah. Fre as friends uh, but, uh, or. But uh, one of your mm. ex's partners. So, it's when your partner's ex tries to get in touch with like. Oh, I so see. All right, so I'm, I'm with you. Not not your ex. Right. No, no. So it's like one of your. Ex-wives' new husband or something like that type of thing. <laughs> Wait, they're, they're the last people I'd talk to. <laughs> yeah, but that's what it is. So yeah. it's <laughs> now I remember, I remember early doors when I, I found one was 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 cheating. She got all dolled up, and I mean, it looking quite nice. And she knocked on the door, and said, "Can I come in? I, there's something I want to sort out with you." And you could see she had. Possibly effects. pegging on her mind. <laughs> she was thinking a bit of pegging going on here. Possibly not. Uh, but it, it's you Put got the, the red one. You got the. <laughs> <laughs> I could have woke up with a red one. <laughs> oh dear. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, she can, she really made an effort. You could tell she was. You know, she looked as good as I'd seen him. Problem was. I had another woman in the house <laughs> at the time, so uh, that, that 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 was not a not a good evening. Anyway, let's crack on. So we've got a whole list of them. Is anyone particularly? Give me one more final one, then, Nick. Uh, bread crum bread crumbing. <laughs> don't eat crumbs in the bed. Don't eat it in the bed. <laughs> It's when you lead them on by messaging with no intention of replying. Oh, I think we've all done that. Ooh. Finish us off in style, then. Yeah, this is about um, strange Christmas presents. Right. Because a lady wants some dentures because she <laughs> accidentally <laughs> swallowed hers when she was eating a mince pie. <laughs> I don't know what's funnier, that fact that she wants dentures for Christmas, or how could he swallow the whole set of dentures? Well, she might just have had, like, one up, little one up the top. I think she's got a whole, like... Top row, a full rack. So it's a, a full rack. <laughs> How would you swallow that all of that? Imagine having to go to the toilet and. <laughs> I know. How, uh, that, uh, <laughs> does that mean your poo? I mean, where does she normally get a mince pies from? I think. Yeah, I know. Your poo might come out crimped. But it, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, just the pain, obviously, as well, if it's a full set. It's going to come out whole, isn't it? Yeah, but if it. Well, I suppose if a key can. 
If you know what I mean, because oh. people have swallowed keys and they've come out. Well, yeah. they, should, they shouldn't disintegrate, really, because if they're in your mouth all the time, then well, they're, yeah, they're that's built it. not to disintegrate. Like, yeah. To yeah, so what are you going to get for Christmas if, if it's not a top row teeth? Well, There's a song there. That's what's just requested. So, but, um, yeah, it's a plate as well, so it's the plate bit. The whole bit. As well yeah. as the teeth. So, okay. but they don't come. Then they don't come separately, you know. <laughs> you I have, I've never <laughs> looked at a pair like a that kinder much. Kinder egg. So. You just got to put them yeah. together. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, nasty. So. Well, there's a Christmas tale. Oh, hang on, pegging. People are replying to pegging. Oh, this is not good. Alan, you can't mention pegging. It's when a lady uses a strap. I know it's not. <laughs> And puts it up a mat. No, no, it's not. That's not what it says in the Urban Dictionary. It's not a dating term, says David of Collectors, who's trying to help me. He's like like the bodyguard. He's hurling himself <laughs> in front of the bullet. But no, apparently to the Urban Dictionary, it's not just that. Um, it might be a bit of that, but it, it's not all that. And Chris says, oh, I mean, peggings when the lady uses it on a man and sticks it up. No, not my thing personally, <laughs> says Chris the Truck. Well, the Urban Dictionary disagrees with you. They just say it's... It's just a sexy thing. There you go. So uh, I'll move quickly and say thank you very much. And that was what we loosely describe as the blah. The voice of the North. Alan Robson's Night Owls. The phone-in that gets you talking. Greatest hits radio. You are with the big one. And the thing that I love most about doing Night Owls is when you get started, you take everything, you're part of what we do. And Tim's just said, Alan, no pegging on air, or you could end up with a red one. Thank you, Tim. It's just, <laughs> it's exactly right. Now, Lionel Richie talking about greatest hits and stars, and we are very, very soon coming up with your third, or with your third bunch of clues for tonight's competition where you can win all that movie memorabilia, which is very nice indeed. But first, we've got to get another greatest hit away and the greatest star, Lionel Richie, about how it was when he was starting out, right at the very beginning. My mother was a school teacher and my father was a um, was a, a military man, so it was one of those oh, things man. where it was... Um, You'd be a disciplined child. I was highly disciplined. <laughs> <laughs> my father did not spare the rod. No, not in any case. You were in the woodshed a lot. You understand. <laughs> you do understand. <laughs> So when, once you decide, though, this is a school teacher who I presume would think, get your qualifications, young man. Oh, absolutely. And there's your, your dad saying, OK, and get them quickly and exactly. look smart while you do it. How do you end up in the music business? Because well, I thought that it had been holding you back there. Well, I can tell you probably one of the most disturbing days of my mother and father's life was the day I presented them with uh, five other guys. Uh, we called ourselves the Commodores. And we were going to take over the world. <laughs> and uh, she looked at me and she said, what did you say? And I said, Mom, we are the mighty, mighty Commodores. And we're going out to, we're going to beat Sly Stone and the Temptations. <laughs> and of course, that's when they decided that I was completely crazy. Yeah. And from then on, it was just one scary day after another until finally one day I brought them a number one record from the Commodores called Machine Gun. Yeah. And my father's tune changed instantly. I was, I heard him talking one day, a father should stand behind his son. <laughs> you know, a child. And I said, Dad, was it, was it the royal to check that changed you? <laughs> what was it exactly? <laughs> Did you call yourself the Commodores trying to outrank him? Well, you know, the, one of those things, not at all. I mean, it was so <laughs> far away, I did not think by a moment that I was going to do this for the rest of my life. Yeah. It was just supposed to be that we were going to make some money while we were going to college. Right. And the next thing we know, we're the opening act for this new group called the Jackson 5. Ooh. And the rest was history. Bit of Lionel all night long. We are greatest hits, and that's how long we go on for. Oh, yes. And we are talking to James. We're going all the way to Wolverhampton in about a minute and a squiddly bit. This is the home of Alan Robson's Night Owls. With the voice of the North. Greatest Hits Radio. Must admit, we are a, we are a radio show of extremes here. Uh, I, I so want to read you this as it, as it comes. Uh, it's from Chris again. He says, Alan, that pegging thing, worst click on Pornhub I ever made. I've never heard of it before. Certainly wasn't expecting what I ended up watching. The most challenging walk ever. Mind you, that might be predictive text. They're going wonky. Chris the truck. 
<laughs> made me smile, made me laugh out loud, Chris. Thank you for that. And also, you know, traditionally, Chris uh, has a habit of sending me uh, a, a whole load of pictures of his children in the back garden and says, can you see the ghost? And I've never been able to see the ghost at all. But Craig and Peter Lee, uh, he's come up with a photograph of his Sunday dinner just to make me hungry because I am absolutely starving at the moment. Hi, Alan, I hope you're hungry. This is my roast beef and gammon dinner that I made today. Yorkshire puddings, green beans, sweet corn, sprouts, roast tatties, mash, turnip and mashed potatoes. Can't go wrong with that. Helping of stuffing and gravy and... Uh, I could, I would murder that right now. So thank you very much for bothering. Uh, time for our next clue, because you'll get the final clue in about 20 minutes, for our competition where you can win all that Jumanji stuff and the Alan Robson Night Owl mug. Clue one, the day before Christmas. Write it down. The name of the film about the pig who thought he was a sheepdog. Write that down. Next clue, another word meaning inebriated. And a military vehicle once built and stood outside of Vickers Armstrong's in Newcastle Scotswood Road. The next clue, men aren't considered pretty. Instead, people call them this word. Pretty's not a word that you would describe a man. Instead, you say, oh, no, he's this word. It's an H word. See if you can get it. Three clues, you've got one more clue to come, you'll get that, as I say, within 20 minutes, but waiting ever so patiently, bless them, is James, who is in Wolverhampton. Hello, James. Hello, James. I said he was waiting ever so patiently. Maybe, <laughs> maybe he wasn't. He, I think he's, oh, hang on, I know where he is. I have found him. Hello, James, are you there? I'm here, Alan. Hey, there we yeah. go. We get you in here. Hoorah! Right. Yeah. So what you got for us, ma'am? Well, I'd like to talk about that um, person that got shot on London Bridge a couple of weeks ago. Uh-huh. Um, he got shot twice. He got shot, shot, shot in the side. Right? Uh -huh. Yeah. And he got, and then, then they shot him in the head. Now, I don't think that. I don't think that's right. I think the police are play, play, playing by their own rules. Now. He was he was he was being held by two other people before the police turned up. Well, kind of held it be him rather than anything, if you know what I mean. Because one of them had a fire extinguisher, the other one had a a, a horn from a, a sea creature, kind of yeah. pointing them away. But uh, I'm, I'm not sure they had him down nailed, if you know what I mean. Well, they, they, they did. They had him nailed because I actually saw pictures of it on the, pictures of it on the television. Right. Well. Okay. And the the, the the police came came, came and moved, moved the moved the two people away. Uh -huh. um, they shot him. They shot the shot the guy that was on the floor in the side. Right. Uh -huh. Now that would have that would have disarmed him. Um, he'd already had the gun take, kicked away from him and the knife. Um, and then they shot then they shot him in the head. Now. Yeah, because they thought he was carrying explosives in his in his chest kit and you'd, you only need a split second for the guy to press a button and boom so i mean he was wearing a, a vest that made it look like he had a bomb attached to him yeah but i, th I think i think the the, the, the family that families that he, the families that the people that he stabbed right mm -hmm. i want to go i want to go and want i want to i want i'm going to want to know um answers of why why he did it and they can't they they can't give the police can't give give them the answers. Nor nor can he now. He's dead. Right, and I hear that. Uh, however, he was literally on on the internet. Apparently, an hour before he went to this meeting that he went to, yeah, he was on the internet espousing terrorists, this, that, and the other, saying. And I, I mean, he was he was only allowed out on license to attend this conference because everybody thought he was getting better. He patently yeah. wasn't. He, he still had uh, a feeling that he it needed to, to to strike back at Britain for what they had done to to you know Syria and the, his homeland. I hear that, yeah. but if there was a chance that this guy had a bomb, yeah, and could have took out twenty, thirty, forty people, you know, in the bridge and below the bridge, whatever was happening underneath, yeah, um, is it not better that you you take the 
the risk of that away by just saying, look, uh, we've hit him in the side, but he's still awake, he's still conscious, he could still press a button and take everybody out. Uh, but, yeah, but, but the thing, but the, the thing that they should have done was they should have, should have entered it, entered it with, with with precaution, which they didn't. I mean, I mean, you 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 take two two guys that two girls two guys that, that, that held him down. Mm-hmm. They didn't they didn't take they didn't take precaution. They they just they waited in. They were super super brave. But as soon as you let him go, as I say, if he had a like a, a bomb jacket on, all you need to do is press a button, and you, the whole thing's gone. And he had yeah. he was wearing a jacket like that. So it's imagine if they hadn't shot him and he'd yeah. killed killed thirty odd people. I mean the then you've you got something to complain to the police about. I, I find it difficult to find anything to complain about them for what I see that they've done. They've gone there, they got there super quick, which was amazing. And yeah. and they took instant action. It wasn't like, well, give us, you know, forty five minutes to put a perimeter around. They had to get straight in there. The public had acted. The public aren't going to take any of this stuff anymore. They're going to, if if you're going to go down, go down fighting. I think seems to be the, the the feeling there. And with a fire extinguisher and a and a and a lump of, of narwhal horn, they managed to hold him at bay until the police got there. And the, the police got there quick. So respect to them for that. Yeah, but don't you think? Don't you think it would have been better to have tased him? If if it, if it had tased him. It would it wouldn't have been wouldn't have been right. Mate, I mean that's that's a possibility. You see, I'd, having never been tasered, I don't know whether if you are being tasered and remember if you're an extremist because you'd have to be um, to do any of the stuff that he did. Uh, if you're an extremist, uh, when you're being tasered, could you not still with your hand shake and grab the button and just go? Because that's the risk you're taking and. I understand what you say. Maybe, and think about this from the government's point of view, and I'm not suggesting, but I am suggesting, maybe the government have said, if there's a terrorist on the street, we don't want him in court, we don't want to have to pay for him at uh, £200,000 a year for the next 40, 50 years. Yeah. Just take this. If it, if he's a terrorist, take him out. It, yeah. it may well be that that's, that's the message that's been put out there. I don't know. But uh, no. I, it wouldn't surprise me. No, it's a it's a death sentence in a country where we haven't really got a death sentence. No, but it's for the same reason we have still got on the statute books. Uh, if somebody commits treason, we can take him out. Now he yeah. wasn't he wasn't British, so he wasn't committing treason. So therefore, it was a terrorist act. Therefore, yeah. the police are legally allowed, presumably, to use their discretion, and they they did. Uh, yeah. And I must admit, uh, I'm not losing sleep that he's gone. I don't know about you. No, I'm not losing sleep, but I, it's just—I <clears throat> mean, I watched it, watched, watched, on, te- watched it on television on the news, and I mm. was just—you just, just thought it could be done in a different way. I understand. Yeah. No, I get you. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right, man. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, um, in um, just over a month's time, it's my 50th. Oh, congratulations. Well done, you. Thank you, thank you very much. And it's not long till Christmas. It's only just over a week till Christmas as well, Alan. Absolutely. I'm, but, I mean, what are you going to do for your 50th? That's a special one for you, surely. You well, gonna... I'm, I'm, going bo- I'm going boogie-woogie in for my 50th. <laughs> well, that sounds pretty good. What, I mean, when you say you're doing that, where are you going to do this? This tremendous um, act. Get, 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 get into a club. <laughs> Brilliant. Hey, well, enjoy yourself. Lovely talking to you, James. All the best. And you. Thanks, Alan. That's fine. For, for, for. I'm simply going boogie woogieing. Yeah, I tell you. When was when did I last boogie? I think I've probably boogied more than I've woogied in my time, but uh, good to know. And why the hell not? 01914 Don't forget, if you would like to send me a text, you can. You simply. Uh, text the word Alan plus your message to 61054. If you want to get on, we still have room for you. And uh, next we have Jeet from Reckon. Hello, Jeet! Hello! 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 Hello. Hello. How are you doing? 
Oh, I'm almost, I'm almost. That's over. good. Wasn't it sad about Eleanor? Yes, it was. Oh, oh my yes. goodness. She was one of loyal, yeah. steadfast and true. Yeah, she was, she was lovely. Well, that's well, then, Bernadette. I know, love to her. I know. Um, I'm just asking for a phone number. Right, okay. Oh, this year. Yeah. Just tell me when you're here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, is she all that friend? Is she going to know all that friend, is she? Is she got somebody to look after that? Uh, I, who, I have no idea. The uh, thing is, she's been been apart from us for a while now, yeah, hasn't she? Ah, see, sure. See, look at her. You know I hear from her. No, absolutely. Well, we, I mean, we've let's face it, we've we've gained more than we've lost over the years, yeah, but no. but it's a shame all the same. It's in. Yeah. And Paul's on Paul Sorry, she never has on Boyd. Paul and Sorry. Don't sound something about Paul something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, yeah. I Tell know. you, there's always something, isn't there? <laughs> so are you set for Christmas then? Going to meet your daughter. All right, so you don't have your tree up or anything? I'm got no one. I'm going to have a tree up this person. Yeah, I've got some stuff there to put up. Right. Uh, I'm going to say some more with him. I'm going to say, yeah. Um, I'm only going to say, it's the President Trump in this yet. So I've got to go and go in. Right. And you can't know, though. Oh, have I sent out? No. That's, no. The President Trump been impeached yet. Has he been impeached yet? He's in the process of being impeached. Oh, wow. And uh, over the last couple of days, he's been insulting Nancy Pelosi's mm -hmm. teeth. So he's yes, yes. he's he's just having to pop at anybody that exactly. he can, but he's he seems to be coming more and more unhinged, though. Ah, yeah, right, yes. he is. Uh, yeah, you, you know, uh, when that man has got them, killed them people on the bridge. Yes. But he must have realised he's killed a young woman and a young man. Yes. He stabbed them. Yeah. For oh, goodness sake. Yeah. In my hands, you go, what? No, I know. I, I personally think the police did exactly the right thing. They did, huh? It's just, if you think about it, they become a problem once they're arrested. I know. Yeah, because they then, well, what do you do with them? You kind of send them back. You send them back. You've, got to, you've got to sentence them That's and right. imprison them for the length of time before uh -huh. you send them back. Right, yeah. So he'd, he'd be in prison for about 35 to 40 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you send him back after we've spent uh, 200 grand a year for, for 40 years. I mean, yeah. who's going to want to do that? Uh, and the the only way of dealing with it's put a bullet in them, uh, right, and it I sounds know. horrible, but it's it does yes, seem that we've got a we now uh, have a death penalty in this uh, country, whether we're prepared to admit it or not. That's right. Yeah. Oh yeah, I would imagine the Queen's wiped the floor with him. Yeah, you'd have thought so, because she, she doesn't take fools gladly, does she? That's the thing. Tell you. Because she's so proud that the youngins are doing so well publicly. And then uh, then Andrew pops out the cupboard with all of this other business going on. Yeah, it's not good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just get the impression that when you, when you've got more more money, you know, than you can ever spend in your life, it's gotta it's gotta kind of twist you somehow. You just think you can, you must think you can do anything and get away with it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Right, so you're going to have a lovely Christmas with the family. I've gone. I've had a found a party on Friday. Lovely. The big, the big family, little fella, a little party for Smashing. the little fancy party. Ah, that's nice. There's a little bit of talk on that. That's I had to get home soon. And then had to then when I had the baby with us. Ah, that's nice. So come out and uh, had a carry on all the time. That's good. Got some with the lady and that. Brilliant. And nice family. Good. Sounds good. Sounds good. What's that, Jesus? What's that, Jesus? Both got a year each. Now, Emily, get a heap of money. That's nice. That's all good. I think Boris is going to Yeah, did you vote for him? Yeah, no, no. Right, OK. Who did you vote for, then? Corbyn. Corbyn, right. Oh, well. Emily Corbyn. <laughs> he, 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 Jennifer. Jennifer's fine. 
Oh, well, that's lovely. We, we'll watch her. Do you want to say hi to anybody, Jean? Right, yeah, right. Oh, bless you. That, that's lovely. For the crew. That's a lo- lovely thing. Thank you very much. Say again? I'm all right. I'm I'm all right. I didn't mean to pull you. No, no, it's all right. I wouldn't have heard you. I wouldn't have heard you. I knew that. I think we'll laugh for you, mate. You have laughed. I watched a pun the other day. It was called Christmas of the Cranks. And it was funny. It was real. It was just here. They weren't going to have Christmas. And they were getting cows. And they were hiding from them. It was so funny. I just know I'm a room. And it's straight down. I'm going to play down. He had my That's but brilliant. Good Absolutely. Good more day. more often than not. Say hello to anybody they fancy yeah. then, Jean. Off you go. I look forward to it. Thank you, Gene. All the best, love. Bye bye. Oh one nine one four double eight three one double eight. The one thing that seems to be missing from most tables these is Christmas crackers. Why don't we get Christmas crackers anymore? I know they used to be always tat, but kind of part of of the tradition, aren't they? Also, how about this, Alan? I'm not sure you've done pegging. Uh, it's when a woman wears. I know people have said that time and time again. However, according to the Urban Dictionary. It's just when a man and woman do the d- thing, thang. They like, like if you two V signs, put one across the other. Well, hey, surely every, uh, every couple's pegged in. I mean, but anyway, everybody else seems to think it's this other thing. And he says, uh, "I'm not talking from experience." You see, you're getting upset. I'm not looking at you to to do that. I'd like to wish you and the team. <laughs> And all the night owls in the world, a very Merry Christmas. Thank you. A bit earlier on, we asked you what kind of things you are frightened of, and we got a good batch of responses. Susan Mourns is scared of wasps. Nicola Sultani, hey! Um, spiders. Julie Aldershaw, rice. Uh, I think that's about weddings. Uh, Dawn Howard Nielsen, peas pudding. I must be the only Jody who hates to be anywhere near that stuff. I love peace bunny. John Thomas, the greatest fear is fear itself. <laughs> Thanks for nothing. And Kerry Hunter, rats walking through long grass. Edwin hates lifts. Tom Mansell, hedgehogs. I'm, he's maybe sat on one. Sarah Jane, snakes. And there's more. Alison Ford. I used to be fearful of absolutely everything until I trained with Paul McKenna back in 2007. My life's been different ever since. I mean, Paul would be thrilled to hear that. Julie Robbins. My biggest fear is living to an old age without my husband, who I nearly lost three years ago. Or who I lost, or who I lost nearly three years ago. Oh, what a damn shame. Um, he's, he'll be with you, he'll be by your side, Julie. Don't worry, don't, don't have any doubts about it. Caitlin Clen, I used to be scared of escalators. The castle keep in town cured me. Yeah, it's all stairs. And Gary Head, uh, the thing he's framed of, my mother-in-law's breath. <laughs> That's brilliant. And then, of course, Time of Christmas, one of the big Christmas songs, Shaking Stevens, I asked him, about his nickname. I, now, I don't know whether this is true or whether it was just malicious gossip, but I heard that you got the nickname Shaking Stevens because one day in during your set, you had to go to the loo. You, were, <laughs> you, you, you went to the gents. There was two men standing next to you. You were a bit vigorous when you'd finished, and <laughs> henceforth, you've always been known as Shaking Stevens. Now, is this oh, true? Oh, God, I, I, I hope that story wouldn't get out <laughs> <laughs> No, but I mean, okay. once you'd built up this reputation, I remember you kind of almost made it, and then boom, I, I thought you were going to have a go. No, it just hasn't happened. And then bang, you, the second time round, you, the door was kicked in, and everything you touched turned to gold after that. Yeah, it, well, it took you uh, 
Well, I made uh, uh, records with no success with sure. the band, uh, but uh, you know, uh, it took took me uh, uh, 16, 17 years to get my first hit record. Really, so that's a long time. For uh, sure, overnight success. Yeah, <laughs> that's what they call them. But once you were there, mind, I don't think I've known a more loyal core base of fans than the people that followed you. Yeah, that's right, yeah. I mean, they, they were loyal, and uh, I was very naive in those days, and uh, I think, you know, uh, Hot Dog opened it up for me in the, yeah. the UK, and uh, Marie Marie in Europe, and then this whole house was was uh, uh, national, I guess. Makes but, it uh, sound like that toilet story was true when you say it was Hot Dog that started it for me. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go, there's Shaken Stevens. Uh, good lad, and he's, the last album he did was so different to anything he'd ever done before. Um, must have took the, the shaky fans to this weird place, but I thought it was really very good. Anyway, let's crack on. I'm going to give you the fourth clue so you can start winning this competition. Clue one, the day before Christmas. What is that? Write it down. The second part of it. The film about the pig who thought he was a sheepdog. What was that called? Second bit, a word that means inebriated. Then you add to that a military vehicle once built and standing outside Vickers Armstrongs. The British had one called a Churchill. The Germans had one called a Tiger, if you're wondering what we're aiming for. Third clue, men aren't pretty, they're this H word. OK? And the fourth clue, women aren't handsome, they're this P word. OK? Women <laughs> aren't handsome, they're this P word. You've now got some lyrics to a very famous song. You've got to put them all together and ring Nicola right now on 0191 488 3188. You've got between now and the end of the show to win all of that Jumanji stuff, the sleeping bag, the rucksack, the cap, plus an Alan Robson greatest hits radio mug. There you go, you can have that for your Christmas as well. Nice little mixture of good stuff here. If you want it, come and get it on 0191 488 3188. If you've never called in before, if you know the answer to this, come and get it. It's waiting for you right now while we talk to Brian, who is in Gateshead. Hello, Brian. Hi, Alan. Um, a couple of uh, things, if that's OK. Of course, yes, whatever you want, man. Yeah. I haven't been on the radio for a while, I haven't rang in, and I have been listening since I've been elsewhere. Okay. But uh, basically, I was going to ask you, are you doing Scary Christmas this year? We're not, because we've just got one day uh, a week at the present moment, so we're hoping for oh, a bit right. more a bit more in the new year. But we will be putting yeah. something else out on YouTube, so get ready for that. All right, that's excellent. Cool. Um, a lot of people have been saying about, oh, the Tories are now becoming the new party for the working classes, and I'm thinking, what a joke. <laughs> right. Can you look at me, look at George Osborne. He's not working class. He doesn't like, he hates the working classes. He made fools of them, call them benefit scoundrels back when he was the uh, mm. Chancellor of the Exchequer. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. He said a lot of horrible, nasty things about yeah. working class people. Uh -huh. And don't forget, uh, Baldabar, Ian Duncan Smith, he's yeah. another nasty piece of work. Reese Mogg, and, uh, Did you want to chuck a few more in? Oh, Reese Mogg, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, plum in the mouth, Reese Mogg as well. You know, I mean, these people are not anything, they've got no association whatsoever with the working classes. So why, and, why I, do I you think, think, why do you think the working, because it is the working classes that have got them in this time, no doubt about it. Yeah. They've given up on Labour and they're not prepared to give anybody else a go, like the SDP or, yeah. or I whatever. Yeah, Alan Wright. A lot of people, like the older generation especially, people in the early 50s and beyond, uh -huh. all wanted to vote Brexit. Let's get out of Europe. We do not want to be part of Europe right. anymore. So hey, oh, United Kingdom, Britain, England or whatever. So a lot of these working classes, like, you know, who live in Stockton on Tees, right. Red Car, Hartlepool and other places around the West Midlands and stuff, yeah. they were saying for a very long time, we want to get out of Europe. You mm -hmm. should respect the wishes of the people who have voted to come out. Right. Unfortunately, um, I need to give a comment. <laughs> no, unfortunately, the um, the Labour Party leader uh, didn't listen to what was mm. being said, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, uh, he said he was going to be neutral. Well, you c It was one of those things where you cannot really be... Too neutral on well, it. Can't, can't you, to be honest, you can't do that. You know I mean, you either want to go or you don't want to go. I, I suppose. But yeah. bottom line is, do, do, if you were, let's say you are that hard-working person that doesn't, 
you know, that doesn't believe in uh, in the, what the Tories believe in, because what we're going to get apparently, if it's the the deal that Boris has got on the table, it's the same one that Theresa May had with a, with a couple of little tweaks here and there. Uh, it's not the deal that Farage and the Brexit Party wanted. And then what they've said is they would vote against it if it, if they had the opportunity to. They're not going to have the well, opportunity I, now. I can't know because obviously uh, Boris has got a massive majority now in Parliament so and do whatever he likes. And obviously, um, I mean, look what's happening in Northern Ireland, Alan. You've got the yeah. Alliance Party, which is like nationalist, and they've mm. also got the Sinn Féin, who's Republican. Yeah. They actually actually hold the balance of power in Northern Ireland right now because obviously they've got more votes between the two of them mm. than all the unionist parties put together. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so that is, you know, obviously their main aim is to unite Ireland and become... Um, well, you know, it might happen now, you know, with uh, if, if, Scotland, well if Scotland do leave. You know should, do you know what the Labour Party should have done? Um, I, I think that the, the guy who's at the top there has to definitely go, right? Mm -hmm, right. Um, I think he's got to go. But what he should have done is this. Some of his uh, policies were ridiculous, offering free this and free that, and obviously people just didn't believe it. Mm. He should have said, we're going to build more council housing. Number two, we'll mm. respect the wishes of the people who have decided to leave the European Union, and we'll go ahead with that. Right. Number three, we'll increase benefits for those who are on that universal credit because it's really ridiculous the amount of money mm. that people have to survive on. Yeah. Number four, we'll pump money into the NHS. Number five, what was the other one I had? Oh, yeah, nationalisation of the railways. We'll partly nationalise southeastern railways because they've had a lot of problems and issues down there, you know, mm. with them. Um, strikes going on and trains not running on time and people are just really fed up of all the industrial action down there so you should have said that we'll nationalise mm. part of the railway and say well, it goes not nationalise the whole lot to me that's yeah. a kind of sensible policy there you're not wasting money and they're not throwing money away around offering free broadband and you know I mean free yeah. this and free that to people and that's what you should have done really respected the wishes of what people have voted even though it was like 52, 48 they should have just said yeah we'll have to go with what the the country has said, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I think what's going to happen now, my worry about Scotland at the minute is um, if Boris doesn't allow them, because a lot of people who voted for the SNP this time around, Alan, are not necessarily, um, you know, they're not necessarily for independence of Scotland. A lot of them, it was a protest force against, against the Tories. Right. A lot of them, when it comes to push, they would say, we want to stay part of the United Kingdom. But uh, mm. obviously, it looks like everybody's voting for the SNP up there because they've got a lot of new... Uh, MPs in place. So. Yeah, but on top of it, I think it's worked in Scotland because they're happy with the government they've got that's looked after them. When here, here never, we are in the northeast, and we're we're an awful long way from the people supposed to be looking yeah. after us. And if you look at this, is one of the things that I couldn't understand about how a tidal wave of Labour seats going to the Tories. The, the reason I couldn't understand it was. Over the last nine years, the North East has been hammered by... I mean, we've, we've been the one of the areas that struggled the most with all the austerity, and yet now I let's agree. put them in for another five years. You go, well, really? Everybody I, doesn't care about stuff about Australia, and all they want is to get out of Europe. Seems, I, seems know, to be the case. Quite, yeah, I've spoken a lot of people who are a lot older than me, and that's all I think about. I yeah. want to leave Europe. I don't want to be part of that uh, bureaucratic yeah. union throwing billions of pounds at us yeah. and want out. Yeah. And that's all they cared about, do you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, I hear you. A, a lot of young people, Alan, look at London. Look, a lot of people in London voted to, to stay in Europe because obviously there's a lot of, you know... They're probably making London, money out of it. Well, there's different nationalities down there. There's all sorts of people living in London from everywhere around the world. So sure. they're obviously not going to be voting to come out of Europe. They want to stay part of Europe, do you know what I mean? Mm. So that, that's the situation there. But uh, honestly, Jeremy Corbyn has made a massive error by mm. thinking that if I sit in the fence, I can put things right, but obviously it's gone badly wrong for him. Can Labour and pull think, it together, though? I mean, can can Labour survive as a party? Because, I mean, realistically, yeah. they're, they're lower than they have been since 1935, which is well, incredible. The is, Alan, do you know the anti-capitalists? You remember about three or four years ago, the, the far left, the anti-capitalists in London were throwing yeah. fire extinguishers at people and smashing windows Riots and, and stuff. stuff, yeah, yeah. Rioting around, yeah. The anti-capitalists, that's what a momentum are made up of people like that in the Labour Party. And, and they're absolutely far, far... Even They make Michael Fox... Like, do, you, do you remember Michael Fox? I, I don't do, remember yeah. him at all very well, but uh, right, no. they make his policies very tame. I mean, the momentum needs to be booted out of Labour altogether. Mm. Because obviously they're like saying, oh, 
It wasn't Brexit. I mean, our, it was Brexit. Oh, our policies were good. People like, like the idea of nationalisation, this and offering this and that. Mm. But uh, they have to go, Alan. Um, do you know who I think should come back? What's that? David Miliband. He's Jewish. If they put him in place, as you know, we put, bring him back in as the leader leader of the Labour Party. I mean, he's an intelligent guy, David Miliband. Um, you know, I know his brother took over, but obviously, if he was brought back in to Labour, mm. they couldn't use um, anti-Semitism against him because obviously he's Jewish himself. Right, and I think he would be seen as more of a Blairite, wouldn't he? A bit of a Blairite type of person, these policies? I would have thought so, but I don't know whether that stands for a good thing because a lot of people demonise Blair now because of the Iraq war and what have you. Yeah, true. But I mean, like um, like you said before, and I've heard you say this quite a few times, the only, well, apart from the Iraq war mm. and David Blunkett opening the doors to immigration, there were two massive errors that, that mm. Tony Blair's... Um, Government. Premiership, you know, had to, you know, and make us endure with. But if it didn't have them, I mean, like, he was a good speaker, and obviously, you know, people kind of liked him in the beginning because obviously he wouldn't have got three terms, would he? Do you remember when he first came in there? Things. No, must I, I hear that, and but but also it's like it's like they're kicking his teeth to see Boris in Sedgefield doing all of that. Oh, saying God, yeah. thanks very much to all these all these other areas around the north that that the Tories have wanted for 50, yeah. 60 years and yeah. never been able to you get. Know, um, Sorry, I didn't talk with you. Sorry? Before I go, I just want, do you know what makes me laugh about Boris? What's he that? played a very clever game, right? He actually played a game as if he was in the opposition. He said, we're going to bring 20,000 police officers back in. People forget it was Theresa May when she was the Home Secretary. She got <laughs> rid of 20,000 police that's officers. That's the Tory right. party did it. Yeah. Yeah. Austerity was responsible for the Tory party. Mm. Neglected the NHS. It was you know, it was the Tory party's responsibility. They were responsible for all that. And he's coming in now saying, "Oh, we're going to change this. We're going to tweak that. We're going to do this." Mm. As if he has never been in. As if his party has never been in government for. Yeah. And that's the kind of people. I think, hey, he's got some great ideas. He's going to bring more police officers in. His government threw them all out at the beginning. Do you know what I mean, got yeah. rid of them all. Yeah, absolutely. So people need to remember that. No, his for sure. party has caused all this chaos. His party brought Brexit mess to the whole country. If it hadn't been for David Cameron, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't be in the situation. We'd still be where we are today. Yeah. And I think the country would have been wouldn't be like it is now because everybody's disunited against everybody. Other. Oh, you're right. Brexit. Yeah, I hate you. I'm a Maria Mayna. You're a Mona. They've got daft names for each other, and it's it's all because of the Tories. Uh, the divide, the division in the country is is still massive. Uh, hopefully, now that everybody's yeah. doing its thing, yeah. maybe that will sort it out. Must move on, Brian, but thank you for Good calling, time. mate. All the best. Thanks, Thanks again. Hey.